This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, I'll talk with three experts on the life and career of American filmmaker Orson Welles, and we will begin in a minute. Well, in this show, uh, I want to talk about uh, Orson Welles, who I think is probably, along with Stanley Kubrick, one of the two best American filmmakers of all time. And uh, certainly, Orson Welles probably did more with less than any other filmmaker I can think of. Uh, as you see from left to right, you'll see Brad Schwartz, Catherine Benamou, and Josh Karp. And if I could uh, allow each of them to talk a little bit about themselves before we get into who Wells was and what he did. So let me start going left to right and start with Brad. If you could take a few minutes and just talk a little bit about yourself and the, your relation and anything you've written about Wells. Sure. Um, thank, first, thank you, Dan, for having me. Um, it's great to be here. I got started, well, I, I first knew of Wells really as a voice on the radio when I was very young. Um, my parents would play these, uh, would give me these cassettes of old time radio shows like The Shadow um, and the Mercury Theater on the Air, which were two of his great radio uh, roles, performances, um, that they would play to get me to go to sleep at night. So I knew him before I knew that he was a filmmaker, uh, a film actor. That was how I, how I knew about him. And then uh, fast forward a decade, maybe 15 years or so, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, um, double majoring in history and film, I learned that thanks to Catherine, um, uh, who I guess is over there, um, uh, the university has uh, what is really the greatest uh, and largest collection of Wells' papers um, uh, anywhere uh, in the world. Uh, and among those I learned from a librarian um, were all of these letters, about uh, 1400 as it turned out, from people who had heard uh, uh, Wells' infamous 1938 War of the World broadcast and had written in um, to him uh, describing their experiences. And these uh, had been donated to the university, I think, in 2005, uh, open for research in 2007. Um, I learned about him when I was a junior in 2010. And uh, at, even at then, nobody had really gone through them yet. There was still a question of what was in there. Uh, so having this background of, of knowing Wells' radio work as a kid, knowing War of the Worlds very well, I'd done a project on it in high school. I uh, thought this would be an amazing opportunity uh, for some research, and as luck would have it, uh, that very week, I think, I was accepted into the, the history honors program, so I needed to uh, find a topic for my senior thesis, and there was War of the Worlds. So I did a thesis uh, using those letters and another 625 at the National Archives that were sent to the FCC and other governmental agencies. Um, and that I got some nice attention from that. I was uh, invited uh, to co-write a 2013 episode of American Experience um, that was about the broadcast that was done for its 75th anniversary. They um, uh, they took some of the letters, mostly letters from Michigan, and um, had actors uh, uh, play the characters. And so it was, it was interesting. I I'd spent so much time with this material, uh, really imagining what these people were like, because you don't have pictures. It's not like, um, uh, you know, writing about someone like Wells, for example, and we know what he looked and sounded like. These people were mysteries. So to get to see actors inhabit these characters and, uh, and give their own read of what these people were like was quite, a, quite an interesting experience. Um, and then uh, after that, that, as I said, aired in 2013, um, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to then kind of write a book based on my thesis research uh, for, for R. Strauss and Giroux, uh, and that was Broadcast Hysteria, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds and the Art of Fake News, and that came out um, just this past May, as we're recording this May of 2015, so um, just in time for the 100th uh, birthday of Orson Welles. So that, that book... Um, expanded on, on my thesis research, talking about uh, you know the broadcast, how it came to be, what its uh, influences were, and sort of the the um, uh, the tenor of the times, and how the the uh, various styles, of what I call fake news in the book, inspired or influenced the show, um, and then really picking apart its reaction, seeing how it was uh, exaggerated, how it was. Um, uh, uh, repurposed 
to fit several different um, uh, points of view because I had discovered that was the great discovery from from looking at these letters was that this uh, at the time seventy five year old event um, that we tend to think of as a relic from another era uh, uh, actually was much more had much more to say about the age of viral media and. Uh, the stuff we we deal with on the internet every day that people had had anticipated. So that it was an instance of having to look in the past where we are now. We got here. So that was how I really how I got introduced to the the wonderful world of Orson Welles. Uh, Brad, while you look like the youngest of the trio, uh, you're probably old enough that uh, your childhood was pre-internet. Did your parents have ca video cassettes or, or just little audio cassettes of? Uh, of Wells, how how did you get a hold of that stuff if it wasn't online at that in your youth? Um, first of all, I, I can't actually remember. I don't I don't remember a time when we didn't have internet access. Okay, um, I'm 25. Okay, uh, so that that is I people have said that's kind of the barrier for being a millennial. If you can't remember the first time you logged onto the internet, you're you're a millennial. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it was audio cassettes. They were um, around that time in the early to mid nineties, um, company called radio spirits was putting all those shows out, uh, mm -hmm. really into the commercial market for the first time. Um, so you had, like I had a, <laughs> I was, I was probably the only, you know, five year old who had a uh, set of Walter Cronkite's favorite, uh, radio shows in the 20th century. Um, so yeah, and it was because these were in catalogs and they were in bookstores, they were kind of available. And so it was, you know, it wasn't that my parents, knew a lot about old time radio or, or were fans of it. My mother uh, is an educator and, and knows how important the spoken word is when you're, when you're growing up um, to developing your language skills. And so she was always thinking of audio books or, or um, all kinds of spoken word and radio. Just there happened to be a lot of it at that, that point in time. Okay. Uh, Catherine, uh, if you could tell a little bit about yourself and uh, your relation, anything you've written about uh, Wells. Okay, um, well, I'm the author of It's All True, um, Orson Welles' Pan American Odyssey, which is a book about his unfinished project in Mexico and Brazil from the early 40s. Um, that was based on my PhD dissertation uh, at New York University, and I'm a, I was also associate producer and senior research executive on the documentary uh, re reconstruction of that project that was released in 1993. Um, I've also written about, uh, I published about F for Fake and published a dossier based on the U of M collections, um, holdings on um, his Macbeth project from the late 40s, which was his last project before he left the States to work in Europe for a number of years. Um, I, of course, knew what a formidable director Orson Welles was. Um, I probably had heard you know, uh, War of the Worlds uh, broadcast. I think uh, CBS radio uh, used to uh, every year uh, play at least a, a segment of that for people on the anniversary of the broadcast um, because they were still at the place I discovered where the broadcast had taken place in New York City. Um, but my real interest in Wells um, happened when I read briefly. Um, in a history of Latin American cinema that he had started this project in Brazil uh, involving one of Brazil's greatest uh, radio and um, screen stars, Granja Telu, I knew was a comic actor, um, and also the Northeast and, and Jangadas. And I had actually lived in the Brazilian Northeast, and I was very intrigued by this. And then I found out that some of the people who had worked with him were still alive and, um, in fact, were interested in um, bringing back this project and sort of salvaging it. And uh, so I met, uh, it was my good fortune that the chair of the NYU Cinema Studies Department, uh, William Simon, was very interested in getting uh, us to collaboratively uh, research uh, Wells radio theater and film career in the late 80s when the Lilly Library collection became available. Um, so we all made these uh, sort of pilgrimage to Lilly to, to dig up the evidence. And um, 
we uh, organized a symposium at NYU, and uh, Richard Wilson was invited there, as was George Fanto, who was cinematographer for the Jean Gaderos uh, segment of It's All True. And at that point, I decided to do oral histories, which I'm very glad I did, uh, because we have, it's just, we have no idea how much knowledge um, can be pulled together from just simply talking to people who worked with Wells. And um, we got oral histories with people who'd worked with him on radio, uh, with actors such as Vincent Price, and so on and so forth. And um, I realized upon conducting these oral histories that there was much more than met the eye and that um, it was worth um, trying to actually go to Brazil and Mexico to the shooting locations and trying to do a more thorough historical reconstruction of this film. And um, George Fanto also worked, by the way, as cinematographer on Othello. So when Othello was re-released in the early 90s, um, he was involved uh, with that. And uh, I learned immensely from him, especially about Wells' ability to shoot on location with, with very little resources. Um, the fact that they basically didn't have electricity when they were shooting on the beaches of Fortaleza. And he said he had to build makeshift uh, reflectors <laughs> to um, somehow um, create um, nuances in the light, which was very, very harsh. It was equatorial lighting conditions. Um, so very difficult to create that kind of chiaroscuro effect that Wells is so fond of creating in his um, studio-produced work. Um, and uh, Richard Wilson was actually not only his associate producer, but he had been sort of the historian, <laughs> the resident historian of the Mercury Archive. And uh, he invited me to help him organize it and to go out uh, to, to California and to start looking at the footage itself and to help him identify the footage. Since I had lived in Brazil, I might be able to uh, locate um, where the footage had been shot and um, make try to make sense out of it um, to prepare for the reconstruction. Um, so years later, when uh, after uh, Richard passed away and the documentary uh, it's all true based on an unfinished film by Orson Welles was released. Um, his son contacted me and uh, said, would you help me organize this? I think we need, uh, I would like this to move to an archive. And fortunately, uh, Michigan was interested in this archive and it was really a treasure trove as uh, Josh, as uh, excuse me, Brad has just <laughs> mentioned. And um, I just want to say, in ter uh, uh, sort of in response to what Brad said about the format of the radio shows, uh, Richard actually took some of the, what his favorite Mercury radio shows, which he also uh, helped to produce, and created a cassette album called Theater of the Imagination, which would have been released in the early 90s. Um, so it's just possible that, I don't know, if that was the version that your mother <laughs> got a hold of. Oh, that's the one. No, I... I, I became familiar with it as I did the research for the book. Okay, yes. Um, so I think uh, one of the uh, main uh, missions that Richard has was had was really to make sure that younger generations of filmmakers and film students could learn about Orson Welles. And that was his purpose uh, in uh, making sure that the first set of papers went to the library, and that was his purpose in uh, lecturing frequently um, as long as he could about uh, his work with Wells. And I think he would be very, very happy to know that Brad <laughs> wrote this thesis and uh, that it became a book and that there is someone of, of Brad's generation very much interested in the work of Orson Wells. And I'm not the only one, as we know. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Josh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about your book and also how you came to Wells and who you are. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I'm, it's a, I knew this before, but it's occurring to me even more. I'm the least scholarly, I would say, of the three um, people you have here because um, my, you know, exposure to Orson Welles before working on this book, and um, it, it was really more from a kind of popular approach, I guess. You know, I mean, I didn't. I was not super steeped in Orson Welles. I mean, I grew up. Um, 
probably like the exact era where people still remembered Citizen Kane and his movies, like the, the average person still remembered him as both a filmmaker and also had him as the Paul Massad pitchman. Because that was really, I mean, I think I was 12 when he started making those ads. So to me, he was, I mean, I, I always loved film. And uh, and I had seen his films, but I also, you know, he was this omnipresent figure in my life on a TV screen doing Dean Martin roasts and, and all that. And I always, you know, he's always a very interesting figure to me. He wasn't somebody I... Yeah, I think that's the way it's been with all my books. It was nothing I ever thought, like, wow, one day, you know, this is going to be something I, I, I write extensively about or, you know, anything towards that. And um, so, yeah, I, ironically, the one connection before I worked on this book that I had is my father had gone to the Todd School, which is where Wells had gone um, growing up, which is completely, and, you know, seemed meaningless to me at the time. Um, which is, I lived just outside of Chicago, and uh, the Todd School was the school in Woodstock, Illinois, that is now defunct and was, you know, just, you know, boys' boarding school. And I, I remember from a very young age my father telling me, you know, my dad is 79 now, about, um, I think my dad was a boarder there in fifth grade, and being in the dining hall the day Orson Welles came to have dinner. And talking about how, you know, he knew who Orson Welles was, but the, you know, he was a kid, so he wasn't like, oh my god, it's Orson Welles, but he said the room just shook about every three minutes when he laughed. He said he laughed and laughed and laughed, you know, but he, and he, he was so struck by that, it became, you know, very ironic for me that I wound up, uh, you know, writing, writing about Welles. Um, so for me, what happened was, I was, this is my third book, and I seem at least, you know, based on three books to have a pattern where about halfway through each book, I get to a point where I go, oh my God, I, I'm not going to finish this book. I'm totally in trouble. I don't know how to get to the end. And I'll take about a month where I distract myself by reading about and getting interested in something else. And I guess, you know, I, I read about the other side of the wind and it had always been really fascinating to me on, um, on a couple of levels. One, I think unfinished things um, that are, you know, attempts at greatness, but that are never completely get done um, have always interested me. And so I, I remember reading about it, you know, having read about it a little bit from that perspective. Secondly, you had Wells making this movie that was both, you know, very much seemed to be about someone very much like him, but also not about someone very much like him. And I found that intriguing, the kind of, you know, what's real, what's not, um, what's him, what's somebody else, and the kind of, you know, this great artist having his big, this big project converge upon him and he converges upon the, the project. Um, and then the third thing was, and probably the thing that initially really got me super interested, was just there were so it, it, it's like um, it's like an urban legend almost there were so many stories that you would hear about this film and none of them were all in the same place and they were all many of them so outlandish both from a just a great story standpoint and also from a poignancy standpoint um and i was intrigued you know that there's a story that's told by at least five different people um about uh, somebody walking in and catching Wells sitting by himself watching Magnificent Ambersons and crying. And it was, you know, and I read it in one place and somebody said, I remember walking in and seeing this. And then I read somewhere else that somebody saw it two years earlier. And it was, it's a good thing the movie was in production for, for six years. So there, there were a lot of different junctures at which um, people could claim to have seen it. But it was fascinating to me. You know, um, it's a little bit like, I always say it's like Will Ch Chamberlain's 100 point game which was not on TV and not on radio and played in Hershey, Pennsylvania before 8,000 people, but something like 250,000 people have claimed to have actually been there and seen the game. And that was kind of the way with these Wells stories. I mean, there were just fantastic stories, but there were so many people who witnessed these poignant moments or these crazy things that it became kind of this mystery of, you know, what really happened and what did it all mean? So for me, I mean, I, I come from a less, you know, more kind of pop culture-ish perspective, I guess. 
Um, but to me, that was just fascinating with this guy who is, you know, like you were saying, like with Kubrick, is one of the two greatest American filmmakers in circumstances that are unimaginable today. I mean, to imagine somebody like Orson Welles being unable to fund a film, um, you know, and kind of running around in this guerrilla filmmaking style and being kind of almost chased out of places as he's trying to get this film done. And to me, that was that was fascinating, and it was a great, an unbelievably great story, and this is the last thing, um, that I thought, you know, God, how many, you know, how many stories like this are left? How many people like Orson Welles and John Houston who gets involved in the story in these incredible circumstances, how many stories like that are there that are left, that I'm going to have to tell in my life? And it just seemed to me, I was like, this is such a great opportunity with such great characters, and, and, and I could not pass them up, so. That's how I got in the writing about Orson Welles. Incidentally, uh, I'm hoping that before the release of uh, The Other Side of the Wind uh, later this year, I had contacted Beatrice Wells as uh, Orson's daughter, uh, who's in charge of that production. Uh, so I, I have been in contact with her manager. So I'm hoping that uh, maybe a few weeks or a month before that's released, I'll have an interview with her. Um, let me just... Uh, I back up i had mentioned that uh, i thought wells got the most from least and uh if i think of like him alongside kubrick that's probably the one reason i would give wells the edge over kubrick is that kubrick could do any film that he wanted basically yeah he didn't get to do his napoleon film but wells really only got uh, the the first two films and the, the second film ambersons was sort of uh ripped away from him um but when i think of what makes wells a great filmmaker uh, I don't think of the the films that people think of the most. I don't think of those two films or Touch of Evil or, or the Shakespearean films. I think of films like F the Fake, and I think of films like The Lady from Shanghai and like Mr. Arkadin and uh, The Trial, but also Chimes at Midnight, which I only saw maybe last year uh, in a version online. And what makes Wells so great is that... Uh, I, while I appreciate Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare is quite overrated, and I think Falstaff is one of his worst characters, but Wells takes this character, who's a throwaway character in four or five plays, strings those vignettes together, adds some things in there, and it's just a brilliant film made on a shoestring budget. And, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that really only someone like Wells would even think of, much less do and accomplish so well. So, uh, let me just end this segment by asking all three of you, if you were to talk about maybe one or two points in Wells as a man or a filmmaker or a theater director that you think made him a great artist, what would that be? Go ahead. First? Yeah. Um, well, obviously for me, it's, it's War of the Worlds. That's what, what got me into this. You know, you were talking about when you, when you said he, he makes more from less, um, that's what radio is all about, right? It's the, the invisible medium. You don't have the visuals that we, we so often associate with him. And when you look at, uh, not just in War of the Worlds, but in his other Mercury broadcasts and later, the things he was able to achieve with sound. Um, in War of the Worlds, for example, you don't, you don't ever really hear the Martians. You hear their, their kind of heat ray machine and the grinding of the, the cylinder as it opens. But out of those two sound effects, one of which was supposedly a pickle jar being unscrewed in a toilet bowl or something, um, you had this remarkable effect. And the way he was able to, again, because he was very plugged into the, the tenor of the times, very plugged into um, uh, the anxiety that was uh, going on with the uh, the march of the Nazis and, and this recent hurricane, and also um, uh, the new trust and, and reliance people had on the news media, uh, broadcast news media, uh, which was a very new thing. That he was able to, to take that and sort of process it, um, uh, probably subconsciously uh, to, a, to a great extent, and to create this thing that even for people who didn't, um, who, who never really believed that it was true, as most, most listeners knew that it wasn't true, um, even those listeners were affected by it on a very deep um, level uh, because it was so so perfectly done. But his the, the way he would he he would mix sound together. His Dracula, which was the first Mercury broadcast, has this wonderfully sort of montage of the way he he jumps through the different perspectives that you see in the novel um, orally 
uh, uh, as just one example. Uh, and then he, he takes that aesthetic, and that's what he applies to Citizen Kane. There have been several people who have remarked, who have, who have written, or remarked that uh, uh, Citizen Kane is a, is a, um, a radio play with pictures because the the uh, attention given to the sound design is, is so so remarkable and so um, directly drawn from radio. He was really the only person uh, doing that in films at that time. Uh, yeah, before I go to Catherine and Josh, let me just follow up on War of the Worlds with you because uh, you, you mentioned the point that it seems to be sort of what we now call an urban legend that you know people are panicked and running in the streets and whatnot. And the, even in the, the well-known Woody Allen comedy of radio days, they do a version of that kind of thing where the, a couple is on a date on in Far Rockaway Beach. They hear the thing and the girl, I think the girl or the guy runs off into the fog in a panic. Um, what... What really happened there? I mean, that, that you know, like you said, most of the people did know it was a play, but it was just well effectively done. I'm sure there may be a few dozen people around the country, but did did uh, CBS, was it CBS that it aired on? Did they just sort of run with it for the publicity? Uh, you bet me, right? Yeah, you. Job. Yeah, you bet. Okay. We have a theme going here. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah it, what happened was, a certain segment of the, the audience did tune in late and believe that it was real for whatever reason. Um, uh, most of them did not understand that it was about Martians. Most people who were frightened did not understand it was about Martians. They thought it was Germans um, or some kind of natural disaster. There had just been this really devastating hurricane about a month before. Um, so a lot of people on the uh, where that had been in New England um, thought that that's what had happened. Um, but the first impulse that many people had um, was, you know, today we would take our phones and go on Google News or something to see what was going on. The closest thing they had to that in 1938 was to pick up the phone and call uh, the radio station, call a newspaper office, um, or call the police. Uh, and so that, you know, that's why um, maybe 20 minutes, a uh, half hour into the show, all these switchboards started lighting up all over the country. And CBS, um, the in uh, New York City, uh, Madison Avenue, where they were doing the show, um, were getting bombarded with these calls from people who sounded agitated, who um, you know all had all these different uh, uh, ideas of what it might have been. Should we have gas masks? Should we um, you know head to the, the highways? Um, but this was a, a, a fraction of the of what was a very small audience, and this particular aspect of the response was sort of directed very um, specifically at these places that um, were exactly the ones that would then uh, report that there had been a panic. You see what I'm saying? Um, the newspaper offices who were getting all these calls sort of uh, naturally assumed, uh, but this was a mistaken assumption, um, that this was a tip of a much larger phenomenon. And it, it turns out it really wasn't. Now you had, you know, the AP um, collected all these sort of scattered um, uh, accounts of hysteria that went out over the news wires, like this woman in Philadelphia, I think, or Pittsburgh, who was going to commit suicide, but her husband stopped her, or the woman in Indianapolis who ran into a church service and said it's the end of the world. Um, incidentally, a lot of the, the news coverage focused on, on women, hysterical women in particular, because that was in you know 1938, that was the stereotype. And uh, a lot of journalists apparently assumed if this was going on, it was mostly women who were, who were doing it. Um, but they, they stitched together these scattered responses into this, what one paper called a wave of mass hysteria that, that never really existed. So it's, you have to be, you can't say it was entirely a myth because, you know, I've seen hundreds of letters um, in the Michigan and the, and the uh, National Archives collection from people who were seriously agitated. Um, but the number who, as in the Woody Allen movie, uh, you know, got in their cars and fled was very, very, very small. Okay. Um, and those just got undue attention because they were so entertaining. All right. Uh, Catherine, what would you uh, define as the hallmark of uh, Wells' greatness? Uh, well, first of all, I would say his versatility, um, his ability to work in studio conditions, but also to work on location with very improvised uh, equipment. Uh, and I think uh, one of the great contributions of Patrick McGilligan's book, which just came out, is that he calls attention to too much Johnson and to 
you know, the, the sort of history of that production, which we actually knew very, very little about, especially, you know, in those days when we were putting together the NYU symposium, it was just almost like, you know, is this really true that there was such a film? <laughs> you know, we didn't even believe the, the, in the existence of the film, let alone that the footage could reveal so much about Wells' uh, early uh, cinematography. So I think there you see him really working uh, with the city, you know, as, as his uh, playground and um, using mobile camera equipment, um, filming uh, action, right, on location. And uh, when we look at that and then we realize that he was able, and I think he alternated throughout his life between um, working with a sort of documentary mode and and working with more fictional, you know, epic proportions, uh, as in his Shakespearean work, um, uh, and his melodramas such as the Magnificent Ambersons. Um, so that developed for him into the essay film, and I think um, he is one of the leading um, uh, practitioners of that form and. Uh, I think that calls attention to his interest in reflexivity, you know, and, 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 and sort of inscribing the effort, right, of, of making the film into the film itself and getting us to think about uh, what filmmaking is about, not just what the text is about, but what filmmaking is about. Um, and the other great talent that he had um, was that as an American director, um, he was he embraced, and this may have been from his travels with his father early in life. Um, he embraced other cultures. He was able to cross uh, national boundaries and to make films in very very different countries and situations. I mean, he was producing films all the way from Eastern Europe, right, um, to the British Isles, to North Africa, <laughs> um, to Latin America, and. He felt quite at home uh, in working in those situations, and he also took advantage of local talent. He was able to recruit talent at those locations to make these productions really a sort of hybrid synthesis <laughs> uh, of cultural sensibilities. And I think that really uh, helped him gain popularity worldwide. I mean, he was quite popular in Latin America even before he began making It's All True. But I think um, they saw in him someone who was generally interested in uh, what their culture had to offer. And uh, they wanted, they were excited to see what someone as talented as he was would, would do with that cultural material. Um, so I think when we think of a global filmmaker, of, of someone who really was a transnational auteur, so to speak, I think he is one of the first. Um, manifestations of that, um, certainly um, as as an American director. Okay, and Josh, what would you posit as a Wells' greatest asset or talent? Uh, you know, there there are two things I think that that immediately come to mind. The first is his creative ambition. I think is to me, I, I, he is somebody who very clearly never wanted to do the same thing twice. Um, and th that was always extraordinary to me. And even within the making of the film, he was just always, you know, I mean, he could take, and, and sometimes, obviously, this was not, did not help him get what he wanted to get done, done in the way he needed to. But what was, you know, he, it's interesting because he was such, his desire to create was, was I think, very pure. And, um, you know, he didn't think of boundaries. And he wanted to do things that, you know, as a real, just a, a movie fan rather than as somebody who studies film, things that, you know, you go to a movie, you're never, as a movie goer, you're not going to notice. Um, and, and a good example being something like the tracking shot at the start of Touch of Evil, which is this extraordinary thing. And once you know what it is, it's incredible. But if you're just a guy going to a movie, you're not necessarily going to notice what that all, what all went into that. But I think, you know, for him to keep himself creating, he, he had to have the world not have boundaries. So he wanted to do things people hadn't done. He, I think, found problems extremely stimulating. I think that's a fascinating aspect of his personality. 
is, you know, somebody said to me that he would create problems in order to create his way out of them. And that through doing that, he was able to make something, you know, all the more, more extraordinary. And yeah, I mean, and there's, you know, for most people, there's the oft told story, you know, about him digging the hole, you know, it's in every, you know, Citizen Kane thing about him did them digging the hole in the studio floor to get the shot. But I think that, you know, the way he kind of came at everything with such fresh eyes and didn't want to do things the way people had done them before, and not just for the sake of doing it differently, it really served a purpose for him. Um, so I think his creative ambition was unbelievable and his, his confidence um, because you know, he's such a complicated guy. I mean, you know, more so than I'm more complicated, he was really a complicated person. But obviously had all kinds of, you know, insecurities hidden behind being, you know, the big Orson Welles. But he, um, his belief that he could pull things off um, and, and his ability to get a huge number of people to buy into it. So many people would tell me stories about doing things on the set where they were like, he asked me, you know, there was one guy who said, you know, he, I arrived on the set and Orson Welles said, okay, get down here, get on your hands and knees. And then he asked me to throw dirt at him in front of the camera. And he was throwing dirt back at me. He said, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm 22 years old and I'm sitting here throwing dirt at Orson Welles. He's throwing dirt at me and there's just a camera. What could we possibly be doing? And then he said he sat and watched it, you know, a couple, you know, a week later they screened the footage. He's like, it was the most unbelievable desert storm you've ever seen in your life. He said, and Wells knew exactly what he was doing, and it seemed completely crazy. But in the moment I was doing it, I was thinking, he's got to know what he's doing. And, and I think that's the other thing. That I think, you know, directors all have that force of personality, obviously, and great directors. Um, have that ability, you know, like a general or some kind of leader to really marshal people to do things. But I think with Wells, there was that quality where people, I mean, there were people who did not, certainly that I interviewed who did not love working for him, but I think 90% of the people, you know, being in his presence was no matter who they were, whether they were somebody who never worked again, or whether they were somebody who went on to this extraordinary career, it was one of the high points of their lives. And I think that, as an artist, really served him, you know, so unbelievably well. Uh, there was, uh, somebody said it was, uh, you know, there was, I think it was Geraldine Fitzgerald said something about how he was like a, like a, um, uh, what's it called, uh, a lighthouse. And she said, you know, you were caught in this beam. It was utterly, you know, dazzling. And then when the beam moved on, you were thrust into darkness. And I think that, you know, that is something that really served him incredibly well because, like, he was somebody who the moment he locked in on you and the moment he said your name, you know, people would talk about how he wouldn't call you by name until he accepted you. And at first, you know, it was like, oh, my God, Orson Welles doesn't like me. Orson Welles is mean. Orson Welles is so gruff. He's so demanding. And then a weekend, he'd say, you know, Mike, you go move that. And they go, oh, my God, he knows my name. And, you know, it seems like a really simple thing. But I think that is why people followed him like a general, you know, and they would go anywhere and people went anywhere and did anything for him. And there's, you know, Mercedes McCambridge as a performer is a great example you know, um, on this film, which shot on and off over the course of six years, she said, you know, with, with Orson, you know, I always keep my costumes in a box. She said, because I never know when he's going to call, but I'm always ready to go. Um, and so, you know, I, mean, I think that, you know, that quality is, is one of the things, while it's a personal quality, I think that as a director, um, you know, is, it, it really is one of the things that made him a great filmmaker. Okay, well, let's uh, end there. And uh, in our next segment, I want to talk about Wells, uh, his pre-film life as a child, and also his work in the theater, which is often uh, short-shrifted. And we'll do that in a moment. In this segment, I'd like to focus on sort of uh, the early part of Wells, uh, his childhood, 
uh, in his pre-film career. Now, Wells was one of those people that probably in popular American culture is one of the first people that uh, the, the mass media and also, I guess, the, the audience came to mind that uh, child prodigy, the term uh, was used about him. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, his later publicity, because I've seen, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, newspaper stories about him uh, uh, playing the piano, uh, uh, juggling, uh, uh, doing magic tricks, writing poetry, uh, doing this, that, and the other thing at the age of eight, ten, or whatever it was. So he he got a, a very early taste of fame uh you know, nothing that is like, you know, YouTube stars of today who can just, you know, have a, a dancing squirrel make them a, a sensation. But but uh, let's talk about uh, where Wells came from and, uh, you know, his uh, work in the theater. So do either any of you want to talk about, uh, you know, his family life? Anyone? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, um, we know that... Um... He had both a wondrous childhood and a very painful childhood at the same time. Um, it was wondrous because his father was an inventor, um, was a world traveler. He traveled to more countries than probably, you know, many other, any other children had, you know, his age at that time. Uh, most children had, weren't exposed um, to Asia, to Europe, uh, and so on. Uh, the way he had, and I think his interest in magic um, developed from those travels. As I understand it, he met, um, or he at least witnessed a performance by Harry Houdini um, during one of those travels. Um, he also had a very talented uh, musician mother, and I think he acquired um, his knowledge and his talent, uh, his musical ear uh, from that. Um, and was playing piano at an early age. And uh, that shows up, especially in It's All True, because he was able to understand the rhythms of the samba music and the differentiated samba music so that he could actually make a film that would show the contrast between samba music coming from the hills of Rio de Janeiro and samba music as it was performed as a popular form of dance music. Um, at music halls and in casinos. And uh, in fact, uh, after uh, It's All True was suspended, he was still thinking about working on a book um, with uh, Robert Meltzer, who uh, had collaborated on It's All True, about Afro, Afro diasporic music, all the way from the, the Caribbean down to Brazil. Um, and I think that that musical ear, uh, we, we shouldn't underestimate how it contributed to his work with sound, not just in radio, but also in terms of sound effects in the theater. If you look at um, the script uh, to uh, Voodoo Macbeth, for example, there's all kinds of notations, uh, very rich notations in that script for certain specific types of sound effects. So I think that developed into a very rich soundscape, uh, both for his theatrical work and for his films. Um, I think we also, I think you're right, we do give short shrift to his work with theater because I think theater, um, even though he dabbled with illustration and he dabbled uh, with music at an early age, I think theater was his first very strong love because he could both perform, which was also part of his work as a magician, uh, but also direct and conceive uh, of these uh, dramatic spaces. And um, we know that he developed that at the Todd School. Um, he was given amazing responsibilities by Skipper Hill. I mean, he's just, um, you know, he uh, really uh, was able to direct and to choreograph, um, uh, you know, while still at Todd School. And he also uh, directed, you know, Summerstock plays, you know, Shakespearean plays. Um, so, uh, I think we see these talents really being nurtured uh, by older generation of people and uh, taken advantage of by Wells very early on. And um, my favorite moment from his uh, early years was when he went to Ireland as a teenager. 
Uh, and actually, that's the first time when he sets off on his own, away from uh, his parents or his guardian in the case, you know, after he lost his uh, parents. Uh, and uh, away from the Todd school to see what he could make of his life. And he chronicled his uh, travels uh, with uh, illustrations. He then had this ambition, right, to get involved with theater when he went to the Gay Theater in Dublin. And then he sought the mentorship of these very, very talented um, Shakespearean actors, um, Hilton Edwards and Michael McLeamore. And uh, I think that um, that was really the, that was really when it came together, when it gelled for him. Uh, and that, that is what, of course, created the basis for his work with the Mercury Theater. Um, and I think later in life, uh, we know we found these fragments of his own autobiography at the Michigan Archive, and he writes about, he devotes a section of that to Ireland, to his travels through Ireland. So I think we should revisit that also in our attempt to understand uh, his talent and who he was as a person. Right, this ability to strike out on your own and uh, explore um, through this uh, sort of very interesting landscape that Ireland is and uh, the Irish theatrical uh, tradition, uh, what possibilities there might be uh, for an artistic career. Well, before we get into, into the theater, uh, Josh or Brad, if you want to talk a little bit about Early Wells, any, any, any uh, points? Sure. I mean, he one of the <clears throat> one of the things, the, the singular aspects of his character that shows up from a very early age when people are talking about him was that Wells had this ha had very well developed language skills even as a very young child. Um, you were talking about the clips of you know I think the headline was actor, cartoonist, poet, and only ten or something like that. Probably you know some of it was genetic and some of it was probably being around adults, particularly uh, intellectual adults. His mother, as Catherine said, um, uh, was a remarkable individual who was uh, in involved in politics, was also a musician, um, and, and raised him to be, to be mindful of, of uh, intellectual pursuits. And so he, he has this, you know, he, as, as a child, he's able to get people to, um, uh, to, to engage with him on the level of an adult and to project this image of being wise beyond his years that stays with him through his entire life. And as, as Josh was saying, he has this charisma um, uh, that, that gets people to follow him. Um, and because he was able to, to project that sense and, and, and charm people to a certain extent, certainly at the Todd School with Roger Hill, as Catherine said, um, you know, his, his early years, um, before and then during and then after the Todd School are a period of profound creative exploration. He's not really given very many limits. Um, his, his mind and his imagination are allowed to roam free. Uh, and, you know, I had a, an English teacher once who said that, uh, that, that we're all creative and society has, well, when we begin at least, uh, and society has this way of beating it out of us. Um, and that never happened with Wells. He was able to preserve that, that kind of creative energy. Uh, and so when you look at his later career um, in every media that he worked in, uh, he had that hatred of limits and that desire to push the boundaries um, and that, that inventiveness of youth, even as an older, older individual. Um, that comes, I think, from his, his childhood and being raised uh, with the idea that he could could do anything he could put his mind to um and it became kind of this a self-fulfilling prophecy that you know if if they're calling him a genius when he's 10 uh he's going to develop into one and he did go ahead yeah Jeff. i just wanted to add i mean i think that you know brad makes the great point i mean i think the lack of boundaries i mean i you know it's funny i mean as somebody i have, I have four kids and you know, we live in a society where every child is a genius now, right? I mean, they're all, you know, they, and they're all encouraged. But he, and he was someone who was so thoroughly encouraged. I mean, I can't think of, you know, I mean, it, now it's such a generic encouragement. He was given a level of freedom and um, 
such a lack of boundaries. And I think it was both a gift and a curse for him. I think it was really the formative, uh, you know, I mean, it was obviously his childhood, so it was formative, but I mean, it was like really the formative aspect of his personality was, you know, he said something, there's some great quote from him where he said, you know, nobody ever told me I was a genius, but it didn't occur to me until middle age that I wasn't one. And, you know, his childhood, he was, not only was he given no boundaries, I mean, he really was allowed to kind of take over. I mean, people, you know, Skipper Hill being a good example, somebody who was a very, you know, especially from my father talking about, was this very charismatic, very dramatic, very forceful personality. He met or young Orson Welles, and I think very quickly was like, I am going to, my purpose is to help this man become what he wants, this child become whatever he wants to become. And he was really, I mean, I think to a great extent, given a free reign at Todd, one of the things I always <laughs> think, I, I think he, you know, if he didn't like a subject, they were kind of like, okay, don't, stu- don't study math, uh, which, you know, that was a curse, <laughs> certainly for him as, as life went on. Um, but he, you know, um, one of the projects was, uh, I think as a teenager, he tried to start doing writing Five Kings, which was taking um, all the King stories or five of the King stories from Shakespeare plays and combining them into a new, I mean, think about that level of ambition when you're a teenager. I mean, I have, you know, I have a teenager and somebody who's about to become a teenager. I mean, they're not thinking about, you know, pulling apart various Shakespeare plays and putting them together in an entirely new, new form. Um, you know, and, and, his, and his childhood was also, I think, a product of the times, too, in the sense that, you know, I mean, he was really, I mean, you couldn't, even in, you know, my, my childhood, I mean, where I was fairly unsupervised, you couldn't be as, he was both incredibly encouraged, but like wildly unsupervised. He was allowed to whatever he dreamed, people encouraged him to do it and he had the freedom to do it. He could kind of just go and do, and there was such a lack of um, constraint upon him. And again, the charisma, you know, the ability of a, what, a 10 year old, 11 year old boy to get somebody like Skipper Hill to just be like, almost, you know, to the point where he was like, you're every bit as important as my family, if not a little bit more important, you know, Um, know, all these people just, gravitated towards him. And I think in, in a way, you know, he didn't get a childhood the way we think of a childhood. Um, and I think that probably was was something that was difficult for him as life went on, because his parents treated him like an adult from like, you know, day one. But at the same time, he wouldn't have become Orson Welles if he hadn't had that. Um, so I think his, you know, we all are products of our upbringing and our environment. But I think he was like this incredible confluence of forces that were perfect to create Orson Welles. Um, you know, somebody of that. You know, he had the talent, he had the brilliance, and everything came together in a way that would make him exactly what he became. The 1930s were uh, a time, you know, with the Great Depression, though. Artists got a lot of government support uh, with the, the alphabet soup uh, uh, you know, uh, relief agencies and whatnot. And, uh, you know, you look at, at the 1930s, O'Neill was still uh, putting some things out. You had people like Lillian Hellman. You had Clifford Odets. You had uh, uh, Noel Coward uh, and those t- sorts of people on Broadway. And, you know, compared to today where you have just Disney productions on Broadway, these were real creative, interesting people doing interesting things. And I could name another half dozen or more. And then yet, even in that, Wells comes along and with, with uh, you mentioned Voodoo Macbeth and some of the other productions, this is almost like a, a revolutionary uh, approach uh, to theater. And uh, so let's talk how he got into the theater. I mean, it, it's from what I've heard, it was Thornton Wilder uh, who uh, uh, helped him get into that life. So... Uh, is that just apocryphal, or what? What's the story of how he got into that that area? Uh, yeah, Thornton Wilder, Catherine. Correct me if I'm wrong. Provided <laughs> the introduction, I believe, to Catherine Cornell, right? Um, who was the uh, who who had this traveling company, and he was in. I think it was two seasons of Romeo and Juliet. Um, uh, this first of which he was 
playing Mercutio and the second he was playing Tybalt, I think he got demoted uh, for bad behavior. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but but that's that's when he was he was traveling around the country doing that, and it was in uh, December of 1934, I think, um, when he's uh, performing as Tybalt uh, in New York uh, when John Houseman spots him and. Uh, you know, there's you could do a whole show about the relationship between those two, but there is sort of a, a, a parallel to Skipper Hill seeing him and saying, "I'm, you know, my purpose is to make this this guy into who he can be." Um, Hausman uh, sees the talent right away and, and decides to associate himself with um, with this guy, who I think he probably sensed even at that time was going to be pretty big. Um, uh, Wells was 19 at the time, and uh, uh, Hausman. Uh, at that time, was trying to establish himself as a producer, um, and he had gotten the rights through some means to this um, play by Archibald McLeish, uh, w wonderfully named Panic, because you know this this is uh, what brings Wells and Hausman together to go on to create more of the worlds, um, which legend has it created a Panic. But uh, so he goes, and the, the lead in this was like a uh, an industrialist in his mid fifties, it had to do with the banking crisis of 1933. And Hausman says, I know the perfect guy for this is the 19 year old, uh, Orson Welles. And so he, he, um, uh, brings the script to Wells. He has to convince McLeish, but Wells, even, you know, by that point has this incredibly resonant voice, um, that can sell the idea that he's somebody, uh, you know, 40 years older than he actually is. Um, and so they put on this show that only really runs for three performances. Um, but that's what, what cements the partnership. Um, and as you said, uh, Dan, uh, at that time, he's, he, they're, they're getting together right in 1933-35, where, 1934-35, where uh, uh, the WPA is just getting in gear, the Federal Theater Project, which is, is uh, ostensibly a, um, a relief, a, a jobs program. But the people involved recognize it as an opportunity to put together the first national federal theater in America, the only federal theater in American history, um, and to do something that's that's uh, good for the culture, not just a, a make work thing. Um, so Wells, you know, say what you will, he had fantastic timing, at least for the first uh, quarter of his life, um, and that an opportunity presents itself to direct this voodoo Macbeth. Um, uh, well, Ed Hausman gets hired to do the, the to co-run uh, what was called the Negro Theater, um, and it's a similar situation where we're going to put on uh, productions of classic plays uh, meant to employ African American actors, stagehands, and uh, technicians. Who's the guy to direct the first one? Twenty-year-old Orson Welles, and so out of that comes this uh, all-black production of Macbeth, set in Haiti. Um, uh, with the voodoo aesthetic, uh, and that's what really sets the town on fire uh, in terms of the publicity that it gets, in terms of the inventiveness of the production. Probably Catherine can talk more about uh, uh, what was inventive about that. But um, from that, you know, the, the publicity of that, Wells and Hausman get their own federal unit, uh, and eventually that becomes the Mercury Theater. So Wells is absolutely the product of this uh, unique moment in American history where uh, uh, we spent federal money on uh, cultural projects on a massive scale. And so you don't get, uh, you don't get War of the Worlds, you don't get Citizen Kane, you don't get any of the films that he did. Um, and the, the richness that brought to our filmic culture and to culture in various forms without that investment in 1935, 36. Okay. Um yeah, the, the Voodoo Macbeth is a good place to start uh, because I think that um, it shows Wells' uh, resourcefulness in getting people from the community to contribute, and music was very important to that production, um, not, and it's not in a way that we wouldn't imagine for Macbeth, right, for the play Macbeth itself. Um, we can see how effects would be important to create this sort of uh, Scottish uh, medieval uh, atmosphere, but we don't think of uh, music certainly as an organizational uh, component of that play. And um, he 
contracted with Asa Dada Defoe to uh, create rhythmic um, interludes with the play, and he also um, wanted ritual to be part of this. And I think that made a lot of sense because we're talking about, um, again, a medieval period uh, in terms of Shakespeare's play, and he wanted to relate it to ritual as a way of bringing in the Haitian um, component of the play and ritual as part of this sort of dramatic transformation of this character, uh, Macbeth. Um, what really surprised people was that he didn't change the language of the play, that he basically trained these actors to deliver uh, lines in Shakespearean verse. So we have the Shakespearean verse with this sort of Caribbean setting. And that's precisely that kind of hybrid um, cultural product that we see um, repeated um, again in Othello, right, where he sets Othello in Morocco. Um, now, um, I think what's important, I think basically I would just call attention to two aspects um, of his stagecraft. One, uh, his inspiration in German expressionism. Um, we see the influence of expressionism, which of course we know um, left its mark um, not only in Europe, but in American culture as well in the 20s and early 30s. Um, in his design, for example, for Caesar, uh, where we have this uh, dramatic lighting, um, this complicated set with uh, pass these passages under the stage, again, exploring the boundaries of the stage itself. Um, and the other thing I think, uh, and having the actors move about in this so that we have really a, a quite spectacular performance. Um, and I think a lot of actors joined him uh, sometimes almost voluntarily because they saw these productions, right, and were so impressed by them that they wanted to be part of this phenomenon. Um, the other thing is that he was involved in progressive politics in the 30s and um, how he finds an aesthetic expression for those politics. And um, The Cradle of Rock was, of course, the pivotal production that took him from the Federal Theater Project. And then when funding was shut down, they found another venue um, near the original venue where they uh, performed the play. And that leads into the formation of the Mercury Theater with John Houseman. Uh, and here he really uh, said, well, why do we need the fourth wall? You know, we'll just have the actors performing from the audience. And that itself gets the audience so engaged, right, in what that theater was about, which was a sort of labor um, dispute. Um, so uh, I think he saw the possibility for educating the public through theater. Um, he then gets involved in recording. Right, some of these, uh, the, 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 you know, um, everybody Shakespeare recordings uh, to teach people how themselves to perform Shakespeare's play. So I think we sense that he really has a commitment to the public good at this point um, and to using theater as a way of encouraging some kind of broader participation um, in cultural production. Um, and that's something which I think people often forget. And I think one of the reasons they forget it is because it may not be as apparent when we think of his films. But it's certainly very apparent when you look at the theater. Go ahead, Josh. I, I, oh, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, the things, and I'm not, um, I think, as well-educated on the theater as, as uh, Brad and Catherine, but I, the thing I always think about is, is the incredible audacity of how... At, at such a young age, again, I mean, I, I just always, you know, think of all the things he did by the time he was 25. And you think, you know, and I think about what I did by the time I was 25. And, you know, his, his incredible energy and his incredible self-confidence and audacity in the way he did things. And I mean, you know, to me, I mean, the idea of taking Macbeth and setting it in Haiti. Um, I mean, I, I recall seeing, uh, uh, and when I was in college, seeing the Mary Wives of Windsor performed in modern dress, and that seeming extraordinary to me. And that was, you know, 1986. Um, and, and so you just think about, you know, his ability to conceptualize and to, to take disparate things and put them together 
and make them richer um, and, and, you know, take something that, you know, Shakespeare is, you know, not always completely accessible for everybody, even some well-educated people, you know, by, and then he was able to take it and make it accessible to all kinds of people um, and make it relevant to people. Um, and when was what, 19, right? I mean, the were 20, you know, I mean, this is just un, unbelievable audacity and unbelievable um, instinct and sensibility for how to dra to dramatize things in a way that will make them both, you know, still, he, I think his, one of the great things he does is that he, things can be incredibly substantial, yet also extremely resonant on a wide, on a wide basis. Um, and, the, and then, of course, I mean, the, the relationship with John Hausman, um, which obviously, you know, there are a lot of different opinions on it, but one of the things, having written about his, you know, possibly most, you know, one of his, you know, he had a lot of, there was a really interesting story with every Wells film ever made, so, you know, not, not all of them were complicated, but, uh, you know, I think with Hausman, and it was not meant to last, there was something that Hausman had, you know, when you're talking about him dedicate seeing Wells and saying, like, I'm going to just exist to make sure that that guy can come in and just be Orson Welles and that there's nothing else. He just, he comes in and he is the brilliant Orson Welles and I am going to dedicate myself to making that happen. And I'm not going to have, he's not going to worry about the money. He's not going to worry about, I'm going to worry about all that stuff for him. And I'm not, you know, and I think one of the real problems for Wells through the rest of his career was that there was nobody who could do it, you know, as completely um, as Hausman did for such a sustained period of time as Hausman did. And I think Wells really needed kind of that, you know, that person who was his complement, who filled in his holes and just had him be Orson Welles. Um, and then I think the, the other thing is obviously, and I'm not sure exactly when he started doing it, but it, along with Hausman, there's the money thing. I know Wells was putting his own money, I believe, into federally funded yes plays, which Brooks, I think that he was the only person to ever put government money into a uh, uh, federal project or put his own money into a federal project <laughs> illegally. Yeah, right. And, and and that was something you know that continued to be, you know, really. I mean, it wasn't federally funded stuff the rest of his life, but he, you know, operated his whole life in opposition to how you make money, right? And certainly in the, in the movie business. I mean, he, you know, it's not other people's money. He put his money, and I think that kind of shows some of the duality, for lack of a better way of putting it, of, of one aspect of Wells, which is, one, from a financial and business personal standpoint, it's, you know, disastrous yes. <laughs> and, right i mean it's you know it, it's literally the, the anti-definition of how you make money or even stay afloat and in, in the movie business and at the same time it speaks of this endless um you know, i mean he, he had trouble raising money too and so that provided a, a need for this but also this belief in himself creatively and that and this desire to create and that he wittingly or unwittingly, was always willing to put himself at risk and do things other people hadn't done, like put his own money into a federally funded project, right? Um, because what mattered to him in the end, I think, was was creating things and creating things in a way that meant something to him that was, you know, as much of a way of realizing his own vision as possible. And that started at a very, very very early stage and i think somebody said it was you know, kind of an aristocratic you know, he was a kind of a born aristocrat you know and so i think you know it, mentally he was a born, he was a born aristocrat yeah. um and so you know and, and money seemed you know kind of like this tawdry thing that he didn't want to talk about but i think you know that idea that it, what really mattered to him so much was the creating and that he was willing to throw his own money into it is, is is a real I think very um, illustrative illustrative of his character and and who he was and what mattered to him. Before we uh, go on in our next segment to talk about film, I just want to spend a, at least a few minutes talking about his radio career outside of War of the Worlds, because I think even up until the late fifties, maybe early sixties, he was still doing some of the Harry Lime radio 
uh, programs, which evolved from the character that he played in uh, The Third Man. He also did voice uh, The Shadow for a while, which was uh, a hugely popular character in those radio days. And uh, I think he also did uh, a recurring production or a... I guess a, a mini series on the radio of Les Miserables, the Hugo novel. So uh, I don't know if Brad or anyone else want to talk a little bit about the non War of the Worlds, because whenever we think of radio and Wells, it's always War of the Worlds. But he did quite a bit for quite a long time in radio. Yeah, um, I mean, he gets started in radio because he had that remarkable voice that everybody, uh, you know, as I said, even when he was a teenager. Uh, he had that that resonant voice um and in those days in the 30s uh, when you're an actor in new york um you could make a pretty good living going from recording studio to recording studio acting without credit um in every you know doing commercials doing uh all kinds of melodramas um the shadow uh which he started doing in i believe 1937 um yeah, would would have been the, the his first major kind of starring role on the radio, um, uh, and that's one that really became associated with him. Uh, but that's one where he wasn't credited, or at least wasn't credited early on. Um, uh, so he, he was known coast to coast as a voice, but not necessarily as a name yet in those days. Um, and he's doing this. You know, there's the the famous story, which I you know I've seen interviews with enough people to. Uh, telling it independently to suggest that it's true, which is that when he's doing his federal theater productions and also doing all these shows on the radio, working something like 18 hours a day, um, he hired an ambulance to go around New York uh, uh, to recording studio to recording studio to get through the traffic because he learned that there's no law or there wasn't any law that said you had to be sick to ride an ambulance. So that was uh, that that was his way of. of creating this really packed schedule and he was doing it as Josh said um, to get money for these productions that are supposed to be funded by the federal government um, to, to do the effects and the, uh, the, the, the various things that um, that he wanted to do that there wasn't money in the budget to do um, and then as as his theatrical career takes off the two are really tied it's, it's right after the, the famous Cradle of Rock production um, when that's one of the first things that gets him on the front pages of New York, um, that uh, I believe it was the Mutual Network <clears throat> hires him to do a seven-week, I think, adaptation of Les Miserables, um, and that's where he's he, he had done um, productions of Shakespeare before, a couple, I think, Hamlet um, and another that's not coming to me at the moment, but uh, uh, that's when he starts to develop his way of adapting and condensing um, uh, uh, existing stories, classic works of fiction and literature um, for the air. And that's sort of the genesis of the show that when he, you know, he and Hausman go off on their own, form their independent Mercury Theater in 38, um, uh, CBS comes to him and with the offer of doing a weekly uh, radio series, first called First Person Singular, then the Mercury Theater on the air. Uh, and this was at a time when the, uh, the major networks, in order to avoid having some of the broadcast spectrum taken uh, for, for educational or uh, public service purposes, would give up hours of the day to what were called sustaining shows, shows that didn't have a commercial sponsor, um, that were news programs or artistic programs or, or something like that, uh, that were meant to be culturally uplifting. And so they gave Wells an hour of prime time and said, you know, adapt really whatever you want. Uh, and that's how he does Dracula, Treasure Island, um, uh, the affairs of Anatole. Uh, that's what obviously gets War of the Worlds. Um, and that show continues in a slightly different form after War of the Worlds for several years. It, it, as soon as War of the Worlds makes him famous, suddenly it picks up a sponsor, uh, Campbell Soup, who becomes the Campbell Playhouse. Because uh, Hausman famously said, uh, I guess they figured if he could make people believe in Martians, he could make them, he could sell Campbell soup. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's that becomes even more than his film work. Um, that radio series uh, establishes his celebrity kind of in the United States. I think that's really what he was most known for. Um, 
in the in the late '30s into the into the early '40s. Um, but he, you know, he was involved in all kinds of racial productions, um, uh, not just fictional works. Uh, in the '40s, later on, um, he had a political commentary type series, which was similar to um, a newspaper column he he ran um, around that time. And you know, when Josh was talking about the audacity of the voodoo Macbeth, I couldn't help thinking of of the racial element, which we were kind of dancing around. Um, but he was someone who had very remarkably progressive views about race um, for his time or, you know, uh, many years later. Um, and the idea of doing that kind of production in 1936, just on the racial standpoint, was very radical. Um, but when later in the 40s, he has this, this weekly um, commentary series, he, he hears about uh, the case of a, a soldier African American soldier named Isaac Woodard, who was returning from uh, the war, World War II, um, and gets beaten up by a, a police officer somewhere in the South. I forget exactly where it was, uh, but the, the name of the officer was withheld. Uh, Woodard was blinded by the attack, uh, and Wells hears about it and, and uses this show to call out this officer he called officer x time and time and time again you know saying your, your crimes will find you out you, you know we'll uh, we'll know your name and, and he he does i mean he he did get the, the officer's name um uh, uh widely known and all, all this attention brought brought to a crime that uh that nobody would have really i think cared about uh on the wider scale if it hadn't been for him um, so he's in in art, in politics, uh, in information. He he did everything, and that's you know his radio work. Um, people always tend to think of it as kind of a stepping stone to the film world, and it was in some ways, but it was remarkable on in its own in its own right. Well, uh, do you, Catherine or Josh, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, well, first of all, I think we should look back at the radio, uh, first of all, the first person singular for this, trying to break away from the institutional voice and to develop a more personable approach to radio presentation and a more conversational style uh, with the audience, uh, which then develops into his essay form uh, in his films. Uh, and then, of course, his editorial presence in the 40s, which was quite important, not only in radio, but also in print media. Um, and on the other hand, his ability to adapt, I mean, his amazing uh, talent at adapting these lengthy literary works into, you know, half hour shows, um, which I think is really, we, we overlook how much that may also have gotten him into Hollywood. I mean, I think he had become a kind of a media personality through War of the Worlds, but I think that they were also interested, especially George Schaefer, who was this new producer at RKO, and adapting the classics from the screen, and they knew that they had Norson Wells, someone who would who would be able to do that. And I think a number of shows, for example, The Magnificent Abersons um, and Heart of Darkness, were both radio programs before they were transformed to screenplays. Um, and so I think it shows again his versatility, is able to think specific, his medium. You know, what is the medium demand? You know what? How? How? What does radio demand in terms of a literary adaptation? Um, getting all these multiple voices um, and the sense of sound space that he develops on the radio. Um, this very rich sense that we have of the depth of space. Um, ensemble acting, uh, which was perfected through these adaptations that he then again applies in 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 film. He takes his Mercury Theater too. Uh, Hollywood uh, to begin making films, and so he has in mind now um, giving body, right, embodying these works on the screen. Um, and uh, again, what Josh was talking about is there's no boundaries, right? We we are just simply choosing a new horizon on which to adapt these works and to think about what are the possibilities. Um, to make these adaptations come to life and not make them simply filmed theater, which of course was this great complaint <laughs> against uh, Laurence Olivier's adaptations of, of Shakespeare uh, in contrast with his. With his. So um, I think radio is very, very important um, to think about it uh, at the root of, of some of his cinematic imagination. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add, you know, kind of 
quickly, I mean, I think, you know, like Catherine was saying, I mean, I think that, you know, his, one of the things he has that I, 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 a lot of people have, but I think he just so extraordinarily, is whatever he learns how to do in the theater, or what he learns how to do in radio, or what he learned, you know, so his ability to condense things as a writer, um, as a dramatist, his ability to, you know, direct people, obviously, his visual abilities, his way to use lighting that comes from the theater, and then he gets sound from radio. And he masters things, I think, so thoroughly um, that, that that's one of the things that when he gets to film, you know, like Brad was saying, you know, this is seen as a stepping stone to film. And it's more of just like a create another creative building block, and he so absorbs how to use all these different things, which I think is one of the things that as a filmmaker makes him so unbelievable is you know, you see some movies and you go, oh, wow, that's just beautiful. And you see some movies and you think, like, wow, wow what a wonderful story. And he brings, you know, almost every creative element you have, yeah, you know, I, I, I almost, you know, in, in re researching him and writing about him, you have the sense that he can do almost everything or understands almost every component better than the person who would be in charge of that, um, which is, you know, the sign of a great, you know, anything, you know, somebody leading an effort is, you know, he has just such a depth of knowledge of all the basic building blocks of putting together a film because he has these experiences. Um, and, and then just, as, you know, as far as his voice, um, it, I, <laughs> there's a story that I know not everybody loves hearing stories about him and Henry Jaglum since he, since Jaglum wrote the book, but there's a great story that Jaglum tells. Um, and I just thought, and I think of what an important aspect of Orson's personality and his existence his voice was and he told the story about how when uh, his first film came out henry jaglum's orson and he were having lunch and orson sat down and started reading the reviews back to him and after about the third review henry jaglum said you know orson you know this is my first movie these are all the first reviews you know, don't you think i've read these before and orson said he said of course you have he said but you haven't heard me read them to you and i think that you know, his, he, that was such an aspect of his personal power. Um, you know, it obviously earned him a great deal of money over the years. And, and you know, how, um, how we get many movies and did other things. But I think the power of his voice and his understanding Powerful that was. Was it, you know another thing? I mean, he had, you know, he's somebody who's it's like a baseball player who can run, hit, throw, hit for power, you know, and he was able to do everything. And I think that you know the radio is just another really good example, and then the ability, his ability to understand the power of his voice and his ability to understand the power of sound. Great. Well, let's end end there, and uh, in our next segment, we'll talk about uh, Wells and film. We'll do that in a moment. Well, now I want to get to sort of the meat of what most people who would want to watch a show like this would want to talk about, and that's uh, Wells' film career. But uh, uh, there's so much online about Citizen Kane and even uh, The Magnificent Ambassadors. I don't want to spend so much time on those films. Uh, I want to focus on some of the films that are usually not talked about uh, uh, to that degree. But let's let's do uh, the, the usual and just talk maybe a few minutes about those first two films and uh, the trajectory of up and down and, and how that affected uh, Wells's later career. So uh, if any of you want to jump in and just sort of give a little, uh, you know, we know, uh, you know, Kane was based upon uh, Hearst and uh, Hearst actively campaigned against the film and, uh, you know, it was certainly innovative in its day, its use of, uh, uh, what do you call the the matte screens or, or, or whatnot. Technically, it was probably the, the most innovative film since Birth of a Nation. So just talk a little bit about those first two films. Any any one of you just... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, how about you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I think um, what's really interesting is that when his A Heart of Darkness project didn't go through because he really did have plans that exceeded 
you know, RKO's uh, budgetary abilities uh, to support at that point. I mean, we have to remember that he had never made a film in Hollywood. Uh, and they didn't, I mean, while they thought, they, they, they knew of his talent to be able to pull together productions um, and to adapt works and so on, I think that they didn't quite, they wanted to give him, uh, him support for a more modest project than that. Um, so, uh, what Citizen Kane opens up is, you know, sort of uh, addressing very serious topics in American history, right? Uh, for and, and and making a very experimental uh, narrative film, uh, which is nonlinear in structure, um, and that was something which was remarked upon even outside the U.S. It was very very impressive to people that didn't follow a, a traditional dramatic structure that we change sort of interlocutors, right? As we move through the film, we hear from uh, people who knew Cain uh, and there's sort of, sort of absent center, which is Cain and what is Cain, right? Which is the mystery. Um, so it was a very original approach um, to creating a biopic, <laughs> to creating a mystery film. Um, and uh, I think we also have underestimated perhaps uh, well, first of all, how much uh, Hearst's opposition to the film meant to Wells and his career. Um, recent historiography has revealed that it even led to some suspicion of Wells' political activities, um, that it contributed to the FBI investi investigation, which followed the production of Native Son. Again, his uh, producing a play right, which um, so prominently uh, focuses on African-American life in the U.S., uh, combined with Citizen Kane, uh, placed him under scrutiny. And that, I think, contributed to his falling out with Hollywood, uh, as well as his desire. I mean, people have made a lot about his desire for creative control, but I think that in the Hollywood of the 40s, um, it certainly weighed um, heavily on, on that career. Um, he did have, I, I think we, we should be skeptical about making, um, sorry, we should be skeptical about uh, transforming this into um, a kind of monolithic vision of his relationship to Hollywood because he actually did have allies in Hollywood and there were some producers, um, for example, at Warner Brothers and at 20th Century Fox, who, who were more supportive of his work, um, and certainly of his working for hire as an actor. Uh, but he could not find again uh, the kind of niche that he found uh, at RKO to be able to develop projects with his ensemble of actors, um, to develop a series of works um, that he could call his, his own. Um, so I think that that really he, he probably underestimated some of the politics in Hollywood when he got involved there, and I don't think he quite understood it uh, very much when he went to Brazil um, and he was completing Aversons. Um, and I didn't think, he, I think he thought that he would have Schaefer's support and that he would be able to go back to the studio and somehow continue working. Um, so that pretty much came as a shock, I think, to him. Um, but I think uh, we also see, um, again, I think certain concepts uh, that we see in later films are, are developed quite early on in Citizen Kane, the relationship between documentary and fiction, um, the importance to mise-en-scene, um, um, tailoring mise-en-scene to meet um, the, the dramatic power of a scene. Um, a little bit of sort of irony, right, in the film in terms of getting us to think about scenes, especially the opera scenes are just full of irony. Um, so in a sense, he's also spoofing um, high culture, even as, you know, he, has, he himself has engaged with it. And, and um, he's getting us to think critically about the media at that point, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, so... Uh, that's what I can say about those early films. The Magnificent Aversons is a very, I think, I think it stands as an example uh, of, of family melodrama that, um, you know, has really been surpassed um, 
by other directors, even with the changes that um, RKO brought to it, unfortunately, because he wasn't able to be present um, for the editing of the film and then didn't realize that the previews were going on in Pomona, Pomona and so on. Um, but to think about the way in which he, he portrays this period of a transition into industrial modernity for the U.S., um, and how that, that demanded a readjustment, right, of, of social uh, class and of, of actually um, so, social life. Um, I think few films have been able to, to portray that. I think there have been attempts, for example, George Stevens with, with the film Giant, um, also Cirque uh, with some of his work, but um, The Magnificent Eversons was really, was really a very powerful film and also drew out very powerful performances by women act actresses. Uh, so I think for the first time we're able to see how he's also touching on the question of gender relations and gender politics. Um, um, the, 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 the character of Fanny, for example, with Agnes Moorhead uh, performance is probably one of the most moving performances, I think, in the film, even more than, you know, George Amberson's <laughs> performance. So. Well, uh, let me just, uh, bef b before we go on, uh, because Josh has to go, let me just give Josh a few minutes to talk a, a little bit about anything he wants to talk about uh, Wells' film career, and then just give him a few final uh, uh, minutes to just wrap up his thoughts. So, uh, uh, Josh, if you could just give some thoughts on uh, what we've been talking about and any final thoughts on Wells before you go. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, you know, just in talking about uh, Kane. I mean, I think, yeah, there was that, well, there's a wonderful quote from him about how he had had, he started out his career with the best luck anybody ever had, and then everything after that was kind of the reverse of that luck, and then he had the worst luck anybody ever had. And, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, I mean, obviously there were things that didn't go perfectly right for him before Kane, but if you really, I mean, you think about the Incredible, extraordinary creative output and the, and the um, just how superlative his work was at such a young age and up to such a you know, up to a certain point and how he was so much I think until the stuff happened with Hearst so much the master of his own destiny um, and then he gets to the, this place where it's really really hard to be the master of your own destiny. Um, you know, he, he and he, he, everything has fought, you know, both his talent and level of his, his encouragement from other people and what's going on in the world has been so incredibly encouraging and fallen so right for him leading up to the release of Cain. And, and for me with Cain, what, what is, uh, you know, unbelievable, and this is a less scholarly perspective, but I think it's just the unbelievable completeness of it as um, as a story and as a film. Um, you know, I mean, like my kids, you know, you could, you know, they can, they you know, very resistant to watching black and white films, right? Because they're kids and they think, you know, that that's, you know, like horse and buggy and, you know, God, how could I watch a black and white film? And it, that is a film that can sustain, I think, anybody from start to finish because he just, and, it, and he does so many different things in it that you never go like, oh, look, he's doing that. It's all just like this beautiful, perfect thing that you don't even, you know, you don't even feel what's happening, but it all just goes right in. Um, and so it's, he creates this beautiful, perfect thing. And then, but then you think about it timing wise um in a way because i, I always think about um, the godfather and in the sense how both films are very much kind of you know almost in, in a very subtle way the story of america right the story of our whole culture like wrapped into this what it means to be in america what it means to be an american wrapped into this you know film and how by 72 or you know whenever godfather comes out that makes it a blockbuster and how in 1941 and with the resistance from hearst it doesn't really make money um 
and you know how things just kind of go just that subtly and not so subtly with her against him and how that just kind of knocks him off his axis just a little bit in terms of his how his career goes um and uh and obviously it goes far off its axis because he has all kinds of trouble since then but i think you know to me what's fascinating and then i kind of came to see um towards the end of writing about the other side of the wind is how much the films are are these bookends um how in other side of the wind which is about you know this legendary director who comes back to make this great um kind of a youth movie of the of new hollywood era um but using kind of a studio perspective on things um you know wells with both films uh he starts them at the end with the death of the main character he um he takes uh he takes these multiple perspectives he does the non-traditional narrative he gives the multiple perspectives because in uh another side of the wind it's there's a documentary being made about the character in fact multiple people are taking videos and, and still pictures of him as the film is going on and then there's the film within the film and but they're really you know it's it's interesting to me i, I always look at his life as such a work of art and how consciously or unconsciously everything he did was kind of constructed as this you know piece of the of being orson welles and to me you know both these films are about men who are kind of great men and trying to understand them in retrospect and from the point of their death and seeing them as other people saw them and so to me even though other side of the wind never gets finished I think there's this, you know, just as Citizen Kane is this, you know, such a beautifully complete thing that, you know, just ties the story up in the end. It leaves you thinking. It doesn't give you an easy answer, but it also is incredibly satisfying. The way he kind of ends his career, I mean, he went on after the other side of the wind, but is also this thing that's like really kind of this fractured version of Kane and is, a, you know, a way, um, almost what Wells was so whole in 1941. And as time went on, both through his own, you know, issues and through the issues he faced in Hollywood, how they all interacted, you know, I think Other Side of the Wind to me always is kind of this, the fractured Wells. It's like somebody took Kane and just hit it with a hammer and that is this represent you know, without him him being Kane or him being the character on the other side of the wind. I always think, you know, he somewhere inside saw his life as this work of art and things he was great at making everything a movie that stood on its own and was wonderful on its own, yet there was always, you know, some element with as with any artist, of it being the Orson Welles story, just a little bit, just a little undercurrent and everything. And I think that, to me, is, is so fascinating how he could make everything so multidimensional and a reflection of himself as a person, a reflection of his art at the time, and then, first and foremost, a reflection of the story he was he was doing. But I think, you know, the the it's so interesting because he's a man who's such a master of his own destiny, destiny up to a certain point. And then when that got knocked off, and it's way more complicated than this, but when that, when suddenly he wasn't the complete master of his own destiny, how his life became, his life and his career just became so much rockier and so much more, you know, uh, so much more difficult and wonderful. I mean, you, know, you think the last, last thing I guess I would say is, you know, you, when you mentioned Kubrick, um, one of the things about Wells and Kubrick is they both made the exact same number of films, I believe, in their career. I think they both, you know, or give or take, I think they both completed 12 films. Um, they both, you know, were certainly artists and visionaries and, you know, art first, you know, and, and you know, popular sentiment second. Yet, um, Kubrick, nobody looks at Kubrick and says, oh my God, the guy only made 12 films, <laughs> right, right? Because Kubrick had, you know, a sponsor at the studio and Kubrick was kind of 
given given that structure and, and they made his world possible where he could just do his projects and wells you know this is where the bad luck comes in wells didn't get that um and if you look at you know his 12 give or take films you know and you think about how many today you know kane amberson's touch of evil um chimes at midnight and uh lady from shanghai you know just and there are others that are important films too but when you think about how those films are regarded you think about people who made 40 and 50 films who didn't necessarily produce that many great you know great well-regarded films that all are, are so different from each other and all just you know it's such an expression of an individual artistic vision um and i think that's one of the things people really forget is just that well there's so much focus on what he didn't do he did so much and he did it so well and he did so many things so well and i think you know people look back on you know some people can look back and say oh you know he became the the, the palmasan wine guy and that was such a come down and he did this and he did that but you know i mean he was hit between the films he made as an actor and the films he directed which is what's of more interest to me i mean he left behind it's just such an unbelievable legacy and brad i'm sure you know you experienced this with your book coming out around his 100th uh, birthday you know mine came out i think like a couple weeks before yours and the level of recognition of him turning 100 so exceeded because you know you work on a book about somebody and you think well of course i think his 100th birthday is going to be huge and i want my book to come out then and i think people are going to pay a huge amount of attention to this but we're all of us are super steeped in and interested in orson wealth the level of interest that his 100th birthday generated i can think of almost nobody else from hollywood um in the, you know in the last 15 or 20 years whose 100th birthday has generated that kind of interest and so he's such a compelling figure and he's such a complicated guy and i think you know there's good reason that people continue to be fascinated with him i mean here we are what 30 30 years after his death so all right well thank you interesting guy i'll ever write about my life that's the last thing i'll say well thank you josh and we'll let you go from here and we'll continue on with Catherine and brad uh so thank you again josh have a great weekend guys All right, we're continuing on with Catherine and Brad. And uh, Catherine, you were just saying that you wanted to speak a little bit to some of the points that Josh had made, so go ahead. Yes, um, Josh was talking about how, you know, it must have been very frustrating for Wells um, not to be in a position of, of creative control and not being able to run his own show, you know, so to speak, in, in Hollywood. In contrast with Kubrick, even though, even though they both ended up making the same number of films, roughly the same number of films, um, that that Kubrick was able to maintain a sort of sense of of, of um, you know of creative um, agency and, and ability um, to see his projects through that that Wells wasn't um, certainly not in the studio setting uh, after Citizen Kane and Magnificent Ambersons, um, and I think this 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 refers back to first of all, models of film sponsorship, right? How films got funded. We talked about the Federal Theater Project being a very, very helpful um, source of support for Wells for his theater projects in the 30s and how felicitous that was that he was beginning his theater career precisely when there were these resources to employ actors, um, to stage plays with a very large popular audience. I don't think the audience for theater in New York has ever been even today, you know, with Broadway, what it was in the 30s. Um, and I think that while uh, Hollywood had all of the apparatus that Wells needed to sort of explore his creative imagination and to think about what the limits were of film representation at the time, to use the sound technology that RKO had, which was the best sound technology among the studios, um, to think about altering camera angles, um, using certain special effects, which even we, we know that Citizen Kane has special effects, which were very effectively used. Um, there's something kind of paradoxical about Wells, that on the one hand, 
He's advanced for his time, right? He's thinking about how to shoot a fiction film on location before many people were working on location. Um, he's working with handheld technology in film before a lot of people were working with handheld technology. Certainly people who were making uh, feature films were not working with 8 millimeter and IMOs and whatnot as they were working on their projects. Um, at the same time, uh, it seems that he is out of sync with the production apparatus as it is, it is set up, right, in terms of uh, economic control um, and the, how that translates into creative control. And that he, he would have liked, and he even said in an interview, I think it was with Bogdanovich, you know, that he would have liked to be living in the Renaissance when you could get that kind of patronage, right? Um, and have a patron and then go off and, and, and create your projects. Um, and, and ironically, this is sort of what happened after he left Hollywood, was that he got these individual patrons to invest in his films, but that didn't really solve the problem because, of course, they were working still in this mid-20th century model, right, of production and distribution and, and theatrical exhibition. And um, the, the kind of funds that were needed to make feature films at those times exceeded, you know, sort of what independent filmmaking may require today. I mean, that we have more options with more technology spectrum today um, and a more flexible sort of uh, uh, situation where self-distribution is, is much more possible than it was at that time. Um, so uh, it's kind of curious to think about them being out of sync in that way and there not being a production context, a stable production context you know, that would allow him to create his work the way he had uh, with his theater in, and, and his radio shows in the 30s, um, and how that, that really couldn't translate across the media uh, into filmmaking. Uh, so that's just something I, I thought of. Well, let me, uh, since we talked about uh, Journey into Fear, and it's all true a bit earlier, let me just jump ahead to the post-war career there. His first film after the war was, you know, the Nazi uh, hunting film, uh, the Stranger, and uh, I think it was the last Hollywood film that he directed. And the, the irony is that uh, while it's a very good film, it's probably his most conventional film uh, that, that he ever directed. And it's also, I think, the, the film that uh, made the most, at least in terms of the investment put in. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about some of the films of the later 40s, uh, either Brad or Catherine? Okay, well, uh, actually, um, it wasn't the last Hollywood film he directed, Macbeth was, okay. before he left for Europe, um, so Lady from Shanghai was actually, uh, he was working on this, um, I think almost concurrently with A Stranger, in the sense that um, that was produced in, yeah, that was produced in 40, 46, but it wasn't released uh, until later, uh, because of his falling out with uh, Harry Cohn, who was the head of uh, Columbia and also had uh, Rita Hayworth as one of his stars, and he was very unhappy with what he did with Rita Hayworth. But getting back to The Stranger, um, The Stranger, I think, uh, brings together, I think in a way, he wanted to work with those constraints uh, in a sense to demonstrate that he was capable of delivering uh, a Hollywood film with the limitations, the budgetary limitations, with a rather conventional screenplay, um, not requiring extensive investment in the mise-en-scene, um, but something which was very timely and something he cared deeply about. We know that he um, supported, for example, the anti-fascist uh, effort in Spain. He actually was asked by um, Hemingway to narrate the Spanish Earth, the documentary about that conflict. Um, so his uh, desire to combat fascism, and then we have, of course, the staging of Caesar, which um, is, is very allegorical and is referring to the Nazi regime uh, in the theater work. Um, I'm sorry, my my uh, <laughs> my canine friend here is is wants to have input into this conversation. Um, so. Uh, However, um, he, uh, so I think he really wants the message. This is a message film, right? This is a message film about just because you, you win a, a, a battle doesn't mean that the ideology is not present and that it can't take root um, with younger generations might be vulnerable to this kind of um, ideology in our society and that we need to guard against uh, fascism at home. 
Uh, and uh, I think to get that message through, he, he really wants to make this sort of noirish um, thriller, of course, with himself in the role of the fascist. And we know that he cast himself uh, as the ogre in more than one film. Um, but uh, I think this is the first instance in which uh, footage of the Holocaust, uh, footage from the concentration camps, was used in a narrative film. Uh, it had appeared, I believe, in some newsreels um, or inklings of um, the atrocities, but uh, it had never been used in the context of a Hollywood-released fiction film. Um, and I think he uses the footage very effectively, again, very carefully, um, separating it from the... Um, from the, the footage, right, of the main, the main diegesis of the film, from the main dramatic space of the film, by having it be projected and having us see that projection ending the same way as he had the newsreel end in Citizen Kane, right, where we have the projector running uh, after the footage has been shown and we start reflecting on the projection itself and what it means. Um, so that was a very bold move, actually, um, and is somewhat controversial. I've had students tell me that they think it was wrong for him to show this in a fiction film, um, that it wasn't ethical on his part as a filmmaker, but actually in the context of the time, he was saying, uh, while we're watching uh, films for entertainment, we can't forget the world around us, you know, and that there are still these risks. Uh, Brad, what are your comments on some of the, the last films in Hollywood that uh, Wells did, uh, Stranger and Macbeth and uh, Shanghai? Uh, well, I think, I think Joe McBride has made the point that Wells uh, is, is most often talked about as a, a failed studio filmmaker when really he's someone who, who was an independent at heart and had an association with the studio that worked uh, better in some films than in others. Uh, and I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, he, he didn't, as, as Catherine was saying, he didn't live at a time when, I mean, I have, you know, an entire film studio in this device uh, with editing software, not just a camera. Um, if he had something similar, he would have had um, uh, uh, a much easier time just with the economics of making film. I mean, film stock is expensive, lights are expensive. Um, so to have to work in that within those constraints um, uh, was not an ideal situation for him, certainly, but he's, he did fantastic work. I'm not, obviously I'm not a film scholar. I can't speak uh, in great detail about, about those later films, but I do, um, I do see him carrying forward this notion. Um, he once, he once remarked, uh, I think in Barbara Leeming's biography, that film is the only industry where they don't do R&D, research and development. You know, every, because of the economics of uh, making films for studios, everything is supposed to be a hit and if it doesn't make money uh regardless of the artistic merits it's a failure um and when you look at so many of his films um not it's his studio films not just citizen kane um straight through to touch of evil the things he's doing i mean i i can't tell you how many times i've seen uh the tracking shot that opens touch of evil used in more conventional narrative i mean just recently uh the latest James Bond film, uh, Spectre, opens with a really long shot that's actually, I think, digitally stitched together. It's not a true um, a long take, the way Touch of Evil was. Um, the uh, the Funhouse uh, sequence and the mirror sequence in uh, Lady from Shanghai is used constantly. Um, uh, obviously, the narrative construction of Citizen Kane uh, and other films that he did um, gets repurposed in, in many, many different contexts. So he's... He's someone who's using what you know. I think he called it the, the greatest electric train set a kid ever had, meaning a film studio, using it to push the boundaries of the medium in ways that uh, maybe the audience wasn't ready for in the in the nineteen forties, um, or wasn't given the opportunity to enjoy. Uh, but filmmakers were certainly paying attention, and you see the that paying dividends in later films. So now, when you play some of those uh, uh, those forties films. For people today uh, who aren't film scholars or cineasts uh, and aren't up on the history, um, 
you know, we've come to expect those kinds of, of techniques and, and effects and, and uh, narrative tricks uh, that he really pioneered. And it's difficult for people to appreciate how revolutionary that was because it wasn't, uh, he was the first person to do it in many ways. Um, and so he, he pushed the boundaries uh, uh, in a way that I think makes those films successes even if they're qualified successes, even if they didn't make money, um, uh, they, they were certainly a benefit to the medium as a whole. Um, I want to talk uh, a, a little bit, uh, and just give me a minute or two to the preamble here. Um, of about six, seven months ago, I did a show on the life and times of Rod Serling, and I had a couple of Rod Serling experts and his daughter interviewed and uh, we talked about Rod Serling's involvement in the film The Planet of the Apes and how Serling has always been sort of downgraded uh, in terms of the final product of the film yet Serling was such a good and idiosyncratic writer that his fingerprints are all over uh, that final screenplay even if maybe only 40 to 60 percent of it was from his original screenplay and I've always argued that I think the studio deliberately downplayed it and there's a parallel that comes in with Wells and the Third Man, because I grew up in the 1970s, and Austin Wells was ubiquitous on the Merv Griffin Show, Johnny Carson, uh, David uh, uh, David uh, uh, Steinberg, um, Dick Cavett, uh, and he was constantly telling his stories of uh, his days uh, in film. He was constantly, in. I grew up in New York City, he was constantly on public radio uh, in various shows talking about this or that, and even on independent television stations. And I remember distinctly him always saying that he had a much larger role than he was ever credited in uh, in The Third Man, not just writing the, the famed uh, uh, Ferris wheel sequence, but also with some of the shots. And, and I have to say, I... I've always been inclined to believe that he did direct some of those scenes because I've seen a lot of Carol Reed stuff, even The Fallen Idol, which came directly before, Agony and the Ecstasy, Oliver, uh, um, the, the one before that, Odd Man Out. And the if you look at Carol Reed's body of work, the third man is so anomalous. It's so out, uh, it's such an outlier in his oeuvre. And it is so Wellsian that that as an artist myself, I I see Wells's deep fingerprints in it. And I also note that when I was a kid, I never remember Wells' uh, claims about his greater involvement in The Third Man being challenged by, by Reed, certainly, or by any of the other actors. Then in the last 20, 25 years, when we got in film commentaries and things uh, and stuff now online... You know, I've heard or seen little clips from people saying, well, yeah, uh, uh, Wells was just bloviating and whatnot. Uh, and certainly I, I don't I don't doubt that Wells was a, a, a primetime bloviator. But what is your opinion, either one of you, uh, about that? Because just like with Serling, I think, being downplayed, his contribution in The Planet of the Apes, uh, I I have to believe just as an artist that, that Wells had a much bigger role in this film of Carol Reed's that is easily the best film Carol Reed ever did and such an outlier stylistically. Okay. Um, well, we have yet to um, find the concrete evidence <laughs> for that uh, participation, but uh, I, think, I think you're right. I think there are so many scenes that resonate with Wells' work, especially the exterior shots. I think um, the shots of the city, uh, the way in which they're framed, the tracking shots through the city, um, this idea of, of of how they were shooting in the, in the you know in the sewer in the sewers of Vienna and so yeah. on, um, all creates this kind of complicated. A chase sequence that 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 resonates with the kind of chase sequences we see in Othello, for example, um, in the bathhouse of of Othello, um, of um, people making their way, uh, you know, through these uh, this very kind of baroque construction. Actually, it's 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 a very baroque movie in a way that other films by Wells were baroque, um, such as um, Citizen Kane. And I think the baroque aesthetic is is very much. Um, at the center of some of Wells' work, both in the theater and in film. Um, so I wouldn't doubt uh, for a minute that he uh, probably did have creative input into that um, 
again, not just the dialogue or the, the, the shooting of the scene in the Ferris wheel. Um, and the other, um, I think there are also some thematic traits uh, of it, such as the betrayal, you know, the friendship and the betrayal. Yeah. Uh, which we see in other films. Such with as the Joseph Cotton Academy. of all actors. Uh-huh. With, jo- with Joseph Cotton of all actors. With Joseph, Joseph Cotton, exactly. Um, and that, that dates back all the way to Citizen Kane, of course, with Joseph Cotton's uh, relationship to Kane and so on. Um, and I think we know of, uh, he did mention in interviews of difficulty with other directors, such as Mike Nichols making Catch-22, you know, where he had these ideas for how scenes should be shot. And of course, um, that they weren't well received. And um, so he felt, um, you know, a bit rebuffed um, in that situation and, and wasn't, it didn't have a good working relationship necessarily in that uh, production. So I think in more than one instance where he was performing, um, he would um, like to give input into the shooting of a scene. How about you, Brad? What What is your take on uh, The Third Man? Uh, it's possibly my favorite film that Wells was involved with, just in terms of enjoying a film as well. It's a, it's a phenomenal piece of work. Um, and I would, I would totally agree it carries elements of his signature. Um, that are as plain as day. I think there's there's a unique. I mean, I, I, as Kevin said, there's no evidence, or there, we don't know of any evidence, and I'm not steeped on it to know um, exactly who did what. But there's a certain alchemy that comes out of the collaborative process. That's what makes film, in particular, um, or any uh, you know performative medium, uh, really special. When you bring together a certain group of people. Every so often, um, you catch lightning in a bottle, and their talents mesh in a way that uh, produces a product that nobody involved could have done on his or her own. Um, that's certainly what happened with War of the Worlds. Wells was a major part of it, um, but you know Howard Koch, who wrote the script, also contributed a lot. Uh, Paul Stewart, who was the associate director, uh, was responsible for a lot of the style, and even some of the actors, like Frank Reddick plates of reporter who gets killed, um, you know, all left a mark on it and, it, and it becomes something that's much more than the sum of its parts. So when you're you're dealing, when you have someone on set like Wells, who has such a big personality, um, who has such a uh, well-known, even at that time, probably cinematic style, uh, you know, you, you kind of can tell, at least you can think you can tell what an Orson Welles film is just by looking at any individual frame. Um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, at the very least, that had an impact on uh, how Carol Reed approached the story um, and and how he was going to portray it on film. So having uh, having Reed, having Wells, having Cotton, having Graham Greene uh, writing the story, um, I can see in that um, uh, the the sort of the, the the brew that creates this really. You know what I would, I would consider a magical uh, piece of filmmaking, just because everything clicks. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, I, I certainly think you can credit Wells' presence uh, for a lot of what makes that a, a very special film, um, and certainly his performance too. Uh, from what I understand, the Harry Lyme character was not um, certainly on the page as charming or as likable yeah. uh, as it was in Wells' uh, uh, hands. And then that's something, always going back to radio, that he carries forward in doing the Harry Lime radio series and giving this character a backstory. Um, and it becomes, I think at least for people who, who were alive at that time, impossible to separate the film character, which comes first, from the, the gloss he puts on it in radio. So he sort of retroactively uh, influences the content of the film in a very in a very interesting way. Well, let's uh, talk then about the, the two films then that he then made over in Europe, Othello, which is, continues his Shakespearean uh, uh, quest, and uh, then uh, Mr. Arcaden, which is 
uh, or sometimes been called the sort of the European cane. And, you know, I had the Criterion version that, uh, well, I had a, a cheap DVD version of the, the original one, and it's it's okay. It's it's Baudelarized, just like Ambersons. And then Criterion Collection did, I guess, uh, a restored version of Wells's version, and then they did sort of a comprehensive version. Have either of you seen the that three-pack, uh, the three-DVD version of Arcaden? Uh Talk a little bit about either of those films, whichever one uh, you want, uh, and, and the, the story behind uh, Arcaden's... Uh, mess I'll leave this up to Catherine well our cotton was a really interesting project uh, because um, it involved uh, well we there are certain controversies first of all about the novel right and, and where the screenplay came from yeah. uh, whether Wells wrote it himself or whether it was ghost written um, but definitely, uh, the story uh, fits this idea, as you're saying, there's a kind of strange relationship to Citizen Kane, right? That there's this figure who, um, whom everyone, and, and, and the, the point is to sort of research the figure's past and to see where the figure has been and, and, and what kind of a person he is, um, I have a read on this film, which again is maybe a little bit different um, from from some others, and that has to do with post-war Europe uh, and the problem of dealing with the weight of the of the recent world war, right, and how destructive it was um, to European societies and. This whole idea of there being uh, informants, right, that lead to people losing their lives, and um, the Zook, the Jacob Zook character, for me, uh, really um, stands out, and, and and that is the scene that opens the film, right? Um, he is, in a sense, still in hiding. He's still a refugee, <laughs> even after the war. Um, and I think this is also a narrative about survival, you know, how people have to survive um, sort of being on the margins of society. And so I think Arkadin is a very ambiguous character. I don't think he is thoroughly as evil maybe as, as Harry Lyme or as, um, as uh, um, the, you know, the character in The Stranger, because I think that um, he is someone who who has a very troubled past, uh, being from Eastern Europe uh, and being Jewish. Right? I think we are just surprised that that is his identity. Uh, and I think that uh, it is a film about that um, identity um, and about a world, a sort of underground world. Um, that is revealed after the war. And um, so I have a, a different sort of reading of that uh, in terms of its allegorical potential. Um, let, let, me, let me ask you this, Catherine, because uh, was he still married to uh, Rita Hayworth at the time? Because there are elements in Arcadon that remind me of Gilda, which is probably his wife's most famous role. Yes, yes. Yes, you're right. But no, he wasn't. No, okay. Um, no, she was already married to someone else. Um, he was married to Paola Mori, okay. uh, I think, at the time. And I think that's around the time that Beatrice may have been born. Um, the uh, In terms of the production itself, uh, it, he got support from a friend. Uh, unfortunately, the production destroyed the friendship. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think uh, Francois Thomas, actually, who was a French Wells expert, uh, presented a paper in Indiana on this subject of correspondence that he had located between Dolivet and Wells, uh, with Dolivet wanting to meet Wells and sort of um, rebuild the friendship and, and that meeting not, not taking place and not able to take place, which is, which is very unfortunate. Uh, but Dolivet had been uh, an editor of The Free World, uh, and had uh, been an advocate for uh, peace after the war uh, and also human rights. And um, 
actually had some hand in some of Wells' journalistic activity in the late 40s and his public speeches. Uh, and um, he saw this, he, he actually produced the film at a point when other production support fell through. And uh, unfortunately, um, he wasn't tolerant of Wells wanting to sort of reshoot scenes and extend the production schedule itself. And the editing schedule, actually. Um, and because Wells did not uh, deliver, uh, you know, a sort of uh, a first cut, you know, a rough cut uh, by a certain date, he then um, took it away from Wells uh, in terms of Wells being able to edit it. And that was very traumatic to Wells, of course, because, again, he's in the situation of having uh, created plans for editing and not being able to finish editing the film. So that is what opens it up to so many different versions. Um, mm. There are some versions such as the British, uh, and I think uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum has written an excellent essay on this where he reviews all of the different versions of Arcaden and discusses the merits and the disadvantages of each of the versions. And I don't think there is any single version that would have, that perfectly reflects Wells' vision. I think there are some versions that are better than others. Um, well, I think I... My, me personally, I think the the longest the Criterion version to me seemed to be the best one. Unlike, say, Apocalypse Now, which uh, has a longer version and a shorter version, which the longer version has a few scenes that are interesting. It also has a few scenes that could be cut out, so it's it's basically a wash. I do think the more that that you see of Arcade, and I, if I recall the Criterion version, there was the original the released version, then they have sort of. I think it was called the Corinth edition, or the Confidential Report. It went under a title in America, I think. They have that version. And then they have sort of the, the hybrid version with some more scenes. And it seems to flesh the character out a bit more. So I think that's the, the best version of the three that I saw. Yes, yes. I, I would agree there. Um, that there's no ideal version, but yeah. of all the versions, that may be the best one. Um, there's also the curious co-production with Spain, <laughs> which required him to use certain actors and to, to film certain sequences in a certain way. And um, we feel sort of the hand of, of, of Frank of Frank of Spain <laughs> in those yeah. scenes, I think. And uh, the fact that they uh, produced, you know, sort of this, this dub version, um, which is kind of interesting. Well, uh, I want to I want to get on to some of the, the later films that we have spoken a little bit of Touch of Evil and just like uh, the first two films and also War of the Worlds, there's a lot of information online about that. So I don't really want to dwell on that film. I want to talk basically about the, the failed production or the, the non-production of the Don Quixote. And then I'll talk a little bit about Trial, Chimes of Midnight, and F of Fake, uh, th those three later films. Uh, just like uh, The Other Side of the Wind, Quixote never got off the ground. Do either of you uh, want to talk about uh, that film and what troubled the production of that? I think uh, I think that that film is, is not, I don't think it should be compared uh, with The Other Side of the Wind in terms of his ability to complete it. Um, there is a theory which I, I partially subscribe to that maybe he couldn't see to the completion of that, that he had an investment in the process of the film itself and I think uh, didn't want to sort of... Um, truncate that process by finishing it as a completed work for release. Um, I think that it started in the late 50s um, while he was working uh, on Touch of Evil. Uh, he was actually shooting um, some scenes in Mexico. Um, there was really very little support for this film um, in, in terms of producers. Uh, and so it really did fulfill a uh, this vision, you know, he he could have had as an independent director, uh, as he was financing most of it himself from his roles in other films and from his work um, producing other films. Um, but there, uh, time, you know, got away from him. I mean, Patty McCormick was no longer a child um, and had got involved in other projects. Um, you know, first, um, you know, Jesus Reguera, uh died and you know he didn't want to replace him necessarily um and then akim tamaroff um passed away and so uh 
it's it's really kind of a tragic um, story, the story of um, Don Quixote, and I think it also reflects his incredible stamina um, in shooting scenes wherever he happened to be, you know, whether he was in Spain or, or Mexico, and sustaining the vision for this film, this vision for this adaptation of, of Cervantes, who I think he really admired as an author and really identified with, in a sense. Um, but sustaining this over years, you know, um, and I think we saw this in Othello. That he was able to complete Othello, even though it was a very longitudinal process involving uh, having to reconstitute the cast, even substituting Desdemona, right, at least three times um, on screen. Um, he was able to make a work which really does cohere in a certain way as an adaptation of Shakespeare's work. Um, so I have no doubt that there was a film there and that had he been able to shoot some of the remaining scenes that he could have made a film. Uh, but I think that the possibility simply waned uh, over time. Um, and uh, I think that we should also try to reconstruct that film. Yeah. I don't think it's been reconstructed. I think it was a mistake to include the, the travelogue footage with it. I think that was a terrible mistake. I'm hoping that we can have access to the full footage to at least restore what can be restored and to perhaps, um, you know, give an audience a little bit of the history of the film's making. Um, there has been some scholarship on this. Adalberto Muller in Brazil has just written a book, published a book in Brazil that contains a lengthy chapter on Don Quixote. So hopefully some of that scholarship can contribute to this. Yeah, I, I want to talk about now my my actual personal favorite film of Wells, which is The Trial. And I think I think it's a, a, a magnificently shot film. I think Anthony Perkins gives the best performance of his career, even better than Psycho and some of the other more famous roles that he was in, because the character that he plays of Kay there uh, isn't just a passive victim that uh, sometimes you get in the book. There, there's a feistiness to, to the character. And I think I think Wells famously said, I read in an interview once, he asked, uh, is, is Perkins's Joseph Kay really guilty? Or is he put upon and, and, and Wells said, oh, he's guilty as hell. Of what? We don't know, but he's guilty as hell. And and the only the only quibble I have with that film is the ending, which which ends differently than the book. And Wells said that he didn't want Kay to be subservient to the knife at the end, so that's why he has this this out of nowhere uh, bomb blow up or whatnot. Uh, let me just ask Brad: Did you have any? Uh, since we haven't spoken to you for a little bit, uh, what are your thoughts uh, uh, about the trial? Uh, uh it's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I. I agree. It's it's a difficult film, I think, for a lot of people to like because it is very dark and and uh, 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 relentless in some ways. I first saw it um, in thirty five on the big screen, and it's uh, similarly to to uh, his earlier films. It, it, it's it's a beautifully shot. Um, it captures uh, um, reflective of Arcadian or uh, the third man that the, the darkness of post-war Europe um, and I think that because it, it um, so perfectly captures that totalitarian um, uh, aesthetic that Wells was kind of uh, railing against that it's difficult for some I mean, Peter Bogdanovich and this is Orson Welles identifies that as his least favorite um, Wells film but I certainly in terms of a um, a unified artistic product. It's one of his more successful films post Kane, where every element I think coheres very nicely. Um, and as you know, Catherine made an excellent point about uh, Othello and uh, Don Quixote just being endurance tests uh, uh, for the filmmaker. You know, there's an, uh, uh, we have this, or there's been propagated this view of Wells as somebody who couldn't finish things, who didn't want to finish things, um, who, you know, just let things uh, um, uh, fade away. But when you look at uh, Othello coming together over like three or four years, something like that, and you have these scenes where you have somebody in Morocco talking in shot, reverse shot to somebody in Venice three years earlier, 
um, and it all fits. It all it all, all comes together beautifully. Um, it's it's a remarkable piece of filmmaking simply for that um, uh, respect and and his his inventiveness. We alluded earlier, I think, to the the bathhouse scene where um, he didn't have the costumes he needed, so he put everybody in. in towels and made it a Turkish bath and it's a much more effective scene um, so he would have had plenty of opportunities to walk away from that if that's what he wanted to do but he stuck with it um, and I forget who it was um, it might have been McBride again who made the point that Wells kind of took that as a as a lesson um, for, a, for a style of filmmaking that he stuck with for the rest of his career you know the idea that he could do a bit here and a bit there um, and, and bring a film together quite successfully when it turned out to be more complicated than that. So maybe it was the wrong lesson um, uh, to take away from that, although it certainly worked in that instance. It didn't work for Don Quixote. It didn't work for the other side of the wind. Uh, but with the trial, again, you have a much more circumscribed, correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of the production time um, and locations, it was all shot in Prague, right? Um, I think it was Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, yeah. Uh, so he's... He's much more concentrated in that respect, and I think it, it does it does hang together um, uh, partly for that reason. Yeah, and I think I think Neva was a sort of mid twentieth century dreary communist architecture filmed better. <laughs> Absolutely right, and that, those wonderful uh, scenes in the train station, I think, where he was uh, supposedly he he had insomnia, so he looked yeah. out and he saw the, the clock face, and that inspired him to shoot those scenes. But the, yeah, the shots of the all the desks and you know it's it's probably uh, almost certainly the best adaptation of a of, of a Kafka story just in terms of the feel of that yeah. that Kafka esque uh, that we all know because uh, we've all experienced it in some form but this it's like it's pure uh, concentrated um, Kafka. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, well, I actually think it's a very unusual film, <laughs> um, and I think that again, as as Brad pointed out, in spite of the fact that. That Wells, that Kafka was not Wells' favorite author, and he didn't really have a desire necessarily to adapt his work. Um, but it ends up being very exemplary of his uh, ability to work, you know, with these dark themes in post-war Europe and to create um, these very impactful uh, scenes um, where we get drawn into um, that narrative. Um, the other thing about it is that it's probably his most subjective his film usually we see wells working with intersubjectivity right with characters interacting um using these ensembles of actors and we come to understand characters through their interactions with others um that's definitely true of touch of evil definitely true of citizen kane and, and of magnificent Eversons and the lady from shanghai and here um because of the nature of the novel he needs to explore this individual consciousness and take us inside that individual consciousness where he really dabbles in the surreal, <laughs> I think, uh, in a way that he doesn't in other films. Um, that image of the, you know, for example, of the painter uh, and getting into the painter's room, I mean, that is sheer, you know, dreamlike uh, uh, surrealism. Um, in that scene, and it's very, very effective. And we have the sense as we're watching this film that we're seeing this world through the lens, right, of Kay's consciousness and and pre-conscious and, and subconscious. And um, that's very unusual for Wells to be working uh, uh, and focalizing a film from from that perspective. Um, and I agree that Anthony Perkins' performance is probably one of his one of his best. Um, and I, so I think, in spite of Wells, he managed to. Uh, he also shot a location in Paris, by the way, in the um, Gare d'Orsay, which is the lawyers' uh, quarters, um, is what we see there. Um, so uh, I, I'm fine with it as an adaptation of Kaka. I don't. I don't see. Um, that it's necessarily a weak film. Um, I just don't consider it um, to be in the same vein uh, as some of his previous works, certainly. Well, uh, before we end this interview, and I give you guys a, a 
few minutes to just wrap up your thoughts on Wells. I just want to talk about those two final films, Falstaff Chimes at Midnight and F for Fake. And both of those films, as divergent as they are, if Orson Welles wasn't acting or wasn't appearing in either of those films, they would not be nearly as good as they are. I, it's hard for me to imagine a film like Chimes of Midnight where a single individual, as a director, as a writer, as the actor, he dominates the screen. This, this is probably the most totally Wellesian Wells film there is in that if you didn't have anyone else, anyone else directing it or anyone else acting in it, it's it's not going to be pulled off. And the same thing with F for Fake, because that came out in the early 70s. And I remember as a child, you had all of these kind of weird do pseudo documentaries like uh, uh, the In Search of Ancient Astronauts, the, the Eric Von Donegan kind of thing. And then this comes out. And this is actually a work of art. It's not really a documentary. I think he, he adapted it from someone else's documentary, added in some scenes and whatnot. And he makes this just brilliant uh, investigation into fakery about this uh, art forger. So if either of you can just opine on uh, either of those two films, pro or con, your thoughts there, and then we'll head towards the end. You want to take Chimes at Midnight and I'll take F for Fake? Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Tappan. Chimes at Midnight, there's a little question that it is probably his best Shakespearean film, um, and one that was very close to his heart. Um, I think he embodies so many characters in Falstaff, um, and there is so much pathos in that film. Again, it's the theme of a friendship uh, betrayed. Um, I think he's able to reconstruct uh, the atmosphere of Elizabethan England uh, amazingly uh, in terms of the a contrast right between the castle and the um, popular tavern, right, and the sort of different concept of sociality that um, uh, they had in that century as compared to ours, um, and his exploring, right, the possibilities of those different forms of sociality um, in the tavern scene. Um, he made incredible use of his Spanish locations again, uh, and uh, I think uh, what comes clear in that film is also, uh, well, first of all, his collaboration with a cinematographer um, to get the uh, battle scene. I don't think anyone else has shot a battle scene like that battle scene, which is actually from the perspective of the people fighting on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. We have a proximity, um, a sort of visceral proximity to that conflict and of the weight, the heaviness of the armor, right, and the blood being shed there that uh, we don't get in, in many other battle scenes. And, um, uh, and then, of course, um, I, I would stress the use of the voice, right, that he uh, works with these different architectural spaces uh, as stages for these performances and these speeches. Um, then we get Gilgood, uh, Gilgood's, um, you know, uh, speeches are so resonant, um, and memorable uh, in that film, as well as his, uh, ability to take someone who obviously is of very, with very little, the character has very little education, has been sort of, um, been sort of uh, uh, improvised his own life um, to be able to give him a sense of uh, morality of himself and, and of uh, generosity of spirit uh, and to get us to like this character <laughs> in fact is <laughs> not that uh, noble a character at all and so he gets us to rethink I think some of our assumptions right um, about about those characters in a way that I think is very very effective, and I think the film um, has has you know I'm so glad that it is coming out. It's going to be re released again uh, through Criterion, and I think it's very important. It's, it is his most important Shakespearean work. How about F a fake, Brad? Yeah, I would only 
I would only add with Chimes at Midnight or, or Stress, what a phenomenal performance, too, it is from, from Wells. Um, I had only, I had my first opportunity to see it last year on the big screen at Indiana, um, and I'd read about, you know, the pivotal scene where, where Falstaff gets spurned by, I guess, King, you know, the King now, um, and what he does, it, he doesn't do a whole lot, but what he does conveys it so, so perfectly, um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a tragedy that that film hasn't got um, the exposure that it deserves, but now it is, um, thankfully. Uh, F for Fake uh, may be uh, my favorite of his directed films. Um, certainly, it's, it's perhaps one of the more personal films he, he ever did. And it's a, it's a key or a, a perfect example of what he... Um, did in response to limitations and difficulties financial and otherwise that he experienced later in life um, not being unable to to finance uh, the kind of big production um, he'd done in the past he does create essentially a new mode of filmmaking and, and 90 percent of or maybe not 90 percent but a good chunk of what's on youtube now uh, is directly in the lineage of what Wells did with F for Fake. As, as I said, you know, um, earlier about the iPhone, I, I'm just so sorry we didn't get to see what he could do um, with these new technologies we kind of take for granted uh, because of what he created using found footage, um, uh, stock footage from you know old uh, uh, B science fiction movies. Um, and he creates this kind of wonderful potpourri that says um, something really profound about what it means to be an artist. Uh, I, you know, you, you mentioned Dan, um, the, the Eric von Daniken pseudoscience uh, that proliferated in the '70s and continues to this day. Um, and the notion, the, the point he makes again and again in that film about the fallibility of experts. Uh, saying this as somebody who's uh, ostensibly an expert on Wells puts me in a bit of an uncomfortable position. But, um, you know, the idea that uh, all these these art uh, historians could be wrong about these paintings that were really by Elmer de Hori, you know, um, uh, certainly he had experienced enough in his lifetime the, uh, to know um, the lies that can be told about artists, about uh, the critical judgments that turn out to be worthless uh, down the line. And he put into a nice um, uh, compact package that really makes a point um, that War of the Worlds demonstrated, I think unconsciously, which was the need to be critical and to think for yourself um, and to not take, as he said um, in his BBC sketchbook series about War of the Worlds, um, to not take the opinions that come to you simply for granted. Um, he certainly, he, he lived that and believed that and, and put it in F for fake. And I would also say the, the, the speech he makes, uh, which would be my favorite moment in my favorite Wells film, about uh, uh, Chartres Cathedral, you know, the cathedral that's so old that nobody knows uh, who built it. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it's this phenomenal work of art and it'll stand on its own for centuries even when the uh, the authorship its authorship uh, has faded away is is a beautiful beautiful piece of writing very profound and anybody who says as people have that um, Wells was no writer or no screenwriter uh, needs to take another look at that because I um, I, I can hardly think of a, another speech in film history that's quite as poignant as that one. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's interesting. People, they have such limited minds. Because I, I, I was did a show on Stanley Kubrick, too, and how people have railed against the coldness, supposedly, of a lot of Kubrick's films, like 2001. And yet I remember the first time I saw 2001... I, I started tearing up when Hal is getting sort of lobotomized in that red scene. And and this I was a eleven or twelve year old boy yeah. and that it, it it a screenplay just doesn't have to be I mean you can do great screenplays. You can have a great screenplay in a John Cassavetti's deeply human way. You can have it in the more detached Kubrickian way. You can have it in a film that comes at reality sideways like F for Fake. And that just shows me the limitations of uh, of a lot of the critics. Um, and uh, you, you had mentioned Catherine the, the the battle scene in uh, 
in uh, uh, chimes uh, at midnight. Um, and it, it reminded me, I always thought, when I saw that, I, I for some reason, I, I, I always thought of... Uh, uh, it was sort of Wells trying to do with his sort of Odessa step sequence, this, this constant moving around and whatnot. It's not on steps, but I, I got that same kind of feel. But anyway, let me ask both of you to just take a couple of minutes and just sum up your thoughts about uh, Wells, uh, the the man, the artist, and where you think he will be going in the next, you know, you know, few decades, uh, reputationally wise. Keeping in mind too that, as I mentioned, Beatrice Wells. Uh, uh, is uh, going to be uh, releasing later this year uh, so, so the supposed final cut of uh, uh, The Other Side of the Wind. So, uh, Catherine, if you want to go first. Okay. Um, well, I think um, Wells has given us a treasure trove <laughs> um, to think about. And what I think this year has shown us is that the scholarship and the appreciation for his accomplishments have hardly ended, right? Um, that now that we have these archives, um, it's sort of incumbent upon us to go back to the archive and to take another look at all of these productions and to see, you know, what insights they can give into into um, how films are produced, um, how he worked ideas maybe from one project and transported them to another because I think he was a great recycler. Um, I think that even though his projects may have been suspended sometimes, he was able to return to, to uh, that he was able to return to some of those ideas and uh, that he was one of the first directors to really work across media, right? He's so intermedial and in that he's able to work effectively in radio as well as film. And I think today, um, maybe some people who are uh, creatively thinking, are not, are not thinking creatively enough about those possibilities. Um, and I think we have, you know, all these books being published this year and we're about to move into the 75th, we are in the 75th year of Citizen Kane. We will be in the 75th year of It's All True. Hopefully that will generate new uh, criticism and revisitations of those films as well. Um, and I think that um, we need to think about the kind of collaborative, I think, uh, you know, Brad talked about this, what a great collaborator he was and how he was, one of his talents, I think Richard Wilson said, was in how he could choose the right people to work with. He knew what he needed as a director. He knew where his shortcomings were and he found those people who were able to devote those energies to those areas uh, of the creative effort. Um, and so we should think about um, the strength of his, of the ensemble acting and of his ability to collaborate um, moving forward. And I'm looking forward to more <laughs> celebrations and um, new releases of films that need to be restored or that perhaps weren't released in optimal form um, as we move into this new uh, second century of Wells. Brad, your thoughts? Um, yeah, building off of what, what Josh said earlier about what a remarkable year 2015 was um, to be a Wellsian. Uh, you know, I traveled around um, to, I think, most of the, uh, if not all of the Wells celebrations in the U.S., in Indiana, at Woodstock, Illinois, um, Kenosha, Wisconsin, University of Michigan, uh, and what kept coming up over and over again um, was, as Catherine pointed out, Wells' status as a multimedia artist, as someone who, you know, for uh, much of his career has been regarded mainly as a film person, but who, as we addressed, did groundbreaking things in radio, in theater, uh, in print, um, uh, in, you know, combining those different kinds of media. Uh, too much Johnson and around the world where he's using film sequences in a stage production. Um, and that's something... Uh, particularly relevant now, I think, when we've you know, the boundaries between different media are breaking down, and if you want to, um, if you want to make art, if you want to work in the entertainment industry, you have to think of yourself um, as someone who could do films, but could also do things online, um, podcasting. So he really anticipated um, the age we now live in of this sort of scattered. Um, media and, and being able to, to work in it and, and to learn um, the the particular um, 
uh, traits of each medium and what could be applied in different contexts, taking what he learned about sound design and radio, using it in film, um, taking what he learned about staging and theater and using it in film. Um, that, so that, I think, is what's going to um, make him uh, a relevant uh, artist uh, for study and appreciation for many, many years to come because he's certainly one of the first people I can think of who uh, was a truly multimedia uh, individual. And the um, seeing the appreciation uh, in the centennial, um, not just for his film work, but for the work he did in other media, uh, uh, really uh, leads me to think that we're going to see more of that in the scholarship going forward. And, you know, as we've talked, there's he did, you know, God knows how many hours of radio that uh, remains to be plumbed. Um, you know, the scripts and, uh, and, and, and sketches and set designs related to stage productions are at Michigan and, and, and the Lilly Library uh, waiting for exploration. So those, uh, and to say nothing of all the, the bits of film that show up on YouTube that he was involved with every now and then, some of which are more flattering than others. So that aspect of his career, I think, uh, is where, where the new great discoveries uh, are to be made. Well, I want to thank both you and Catherine for your time, as well as thanking Josh Carp, who had to leave a little bit earlier. Uh, this weekend, uh, this show was on Orson Welles. Yesterday I did a show on Kurt Vonnegut. And next weekend I'll be doing another filmmaker and another novelist. I'll be talking about Ingmar Bergman and Charles Dickens. And if you enjoyed this show, you can look below and you'll see links links uh, to the works and, and writings of all my three of my guests here. So again, I want to thank both Catherine and Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.